Welcome to History Schmistery. History Schmistery, part two. Part part two. It's our second our second episode. We made it back. And um, I'm John. And I'm Jeremiah. And uh, we're we're back with our um, fucking just long. It's, it's gonna be a long haul, but you're gonna enjoy it. Buckle in. Buckle in. <laughs> uh, it should have been a multi part uh, episode, but it's not. It's uh, Ibn Battuta. Your boy. Ibn Battuta. Dun, dun. Um, yeah, he, he thought Marco Polo's journey was long. This was three times as long. This was so. a long journey. And for a long time. I mean, he... 27? 29 years? 27 years? I don't know the exact... Yeah, I don't know. Less I, than 30, but pretty close to 30. So, Jeremiah um, watched uh, documentaries, right? I did. And you read parts of the Rila itself. I did. Okay. And I pretty much was, I, I bought the Rila, a uh, translation of it by um, a dude, uh, and I bought another book that's called The Adventures of Ibn Battuta by a guy named Ross E. Dunn, and he kind of like goes through the book and like gives background information and like has maps and stuff like that in there. Um, and I relied heavily on those two things. I didn't really look anywhere else. Um, because, you know, this was... It's two books. It was two books. It was a lot of, of, a lot of reading. And I only went halfway through both of them, and it was a lot. Right, and it's um, only been like three weeks since we did Mons Musa, so I mean, that's you read two, you read two books in three weeks. That's I, you know, I, I, well, I read books every well, once in a while. Well, on top of everything else you do. I learned to read for this podcast. That's right. What I didn't know before, <laughs> and I learned um, so we could do this, so thank, you're welcome. Oh, you're welcome, and uh, before we get started, I did want to... We are a history program... So I did want to um, loosely, loose, loosely, loose history, but we still have we have scruples and standards. And uh, so <laughs> I I wanted to apologize for some of the statements that I I had made on our previous podcast. Um, you may not even remember or notice, um, but we we were talking about um, how relaxed the Mali Empire was and that it would mirrored very much like the era of good feelings, which that is still true. But what I said was that um, that was pre war of 1812 that was very much the after the war of 1812 and uh and i apologize for that that was that was in, in inaccurate historically yeah. and then um the trip the hajj which actually is very important to clarify for this one um some of the things i said were true about the hajj but it was not quite a full picture um what is i, I do forget the place in mecca that they go what is that you knew it last time um they go to several different places. No, the, um, the black box. Oh, the Kaaba. The, the Kaaba. The Kaaba. Okay. So what that I think that's how is, you're saying it. So yeah. what that is, is um, basically in the origin how um, Islam came around, is um, Abraham and Sarah couldn't have a kid. So Sarah got her handmaiden, this is a fast version, uh, Sarah got her handmaiden to have a son with Abraham. Abraham and, and the handmaiden did. His name was Ishmael. Then Abraham and Sarah eventually did have a son. His name was Jacob. Mm -hmm. And um, so Sarah then was jealous, kicked um, Ishmael and his mom out because, you know, she wanted her son to take over the mm -hmm. tribe. And so that's where uh, Judaism comes from, is from Sarah's child. Islam comes from Ishmael's tribe. Which so, one was Isaac? Wasn't uh, there think, an Isaac in there? Yeah, yeah, somewhere. It might have been Isaac instead of Jacob. I'm not up on my, bi my right. biblical history. <laughs> if you're looking for, just to clarify, if you're looking for, uh, you, you're, there's way better sources to consult. About. Well, there, there'll be a third episode. We'll clarify there. Yeah, there you go. So we always have room to grow. Right. Um, um, but anyway, I don't want to offend anybody's religious sensibilities. Right. So where, <laughs> the, where this place comes from is um, Ishmael and his mom are traveling through the desert and they're about to die. So God sends down and, and breaks into the ground to push out water for them to drink. Mm -hmm. And then so that becomes a holy site. And that is where Mecca starts. Whoa. And then um, so the, there is eventually a city that grows up or you know, kind of a city that grows up around it. It became a kind of a, a religious hotspot. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were, you know, before it was called the Hajj, Many people were traveling there because, you know, they heard the story of, you know, this miracle that had happened in the middle of the desert. Yeah. And so a lot of people were coming. And so a lot of those people were still praying towards Jerusalem. Okay. And then, um, so the, then in Muhammad's time, they were the people that were like the tenders of this, of this holy site. Okay. And then, um, so they were kind of herders, farmers, and, uh, well, maybe mainly herders of, uh, of sheep and, uh, 
So then Muhammad got the the message from God. So the rest of that is true. You know, they kicked out, came back, took over Mecca. But that is where the Kaaba comes from. Okay. That's why that that's why Mecca specifically is a holy spot because the the progeny, you know, or not the progeny, but you know, the progenitor of their religion was gonna die. God intervened, made water. Okay. That makes sense. So that's why people go there because that that's why Muslims go there because that is where Islam started. Okay. Before even Muhammad. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that's important because in Batuta goes on at least three Hajjis. I, I think four. four. But yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's a, it's a, it's a Hajj, because you go, there's there's a period of time where you're supposed to go, right? There's right, a right, Hajj right. season or, or whatever. I, I do have a, a friend, Ghassan, and um, he's a Sunni Muslim, and they say that there is a specific time of Hajj. Yeah. But... You can go anytime. Okay. Like there's a big... You can, it fulfills your your Hajj requirement or exactly, whatever. Exactly, right. Yeah. Because, you know, there is the specific time, but I mean, if you can go. Yeah. And it's better in June than when the Hajj is that year in August, go. Yeah. You know, so I mean, there is a specific time, but it's kind of a Hajj whenever you can make it. Well, so he makes, yeah. So Ibn Batuta, either way, goes to Mecca four times. One time he stays there for three years. He's a big fan of Mecca. All right. So I now we know what the say. Hajj is. <laughs> And this, and, yeah. and the Hajj kind of starts the travels, but, but John, tell me about Ibn Battuta. Where did, where are we starting from? So, Ibn Battuta was born in Tangiers, Morocco, okay. uh, in 1304. Does that make him a tangerine? I, I, you know, I did see a book that said, uh, it, it the name does. of the book was, yeah. It does. Yeah. I heard in a documentary, it makes him, not a fruit, but it makes him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, he's a tangerine. Uh, so our young tangerine, we don't really know a lot about how or what specifics about what he did. Um, we have information about what life was like for people in that time, um, and what life would have been like for a member of the... I mean, for lack of a better term, the gentry, the right. like the noble, and not John and I don't have information. Like none, we none of us, no one does. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, no. Like so, yeah. There's no <laughs> primary sources on what Ibn Battuta was doing. Uh, when I say we, I guess I mean scholarship in general or whatever. Um, You're the royal we. The royal we, yeah. <laughs> uh, the most important we. Um, but like the so there's no, but we have an idea of what life was like for people back then. He was probably um, brought up. He ends up becoming a cadi or a judge, a person who is like, you know, their job is to interpret the laws essentially um, based on... Religious laws. Yeah. Well, yeah. But it, at this time, the religious law and secular law, it, at least in the Dar al-Islam, in terms of what... Kind of the same thing. Yeah. It's yeah, the yeah, same yeah. deal. Yeah. Um, so, and there, yeah, there's not... And this is, you know, based on like the way we understand like Western history... In Western history, or in Western, I shouldn't say Western history, but in Western European history, there is this, like, differentiation between secular and religious law. In the times we're talking about, they were very much often the same thing, but there still was a differentiation between right. the two powers. We had a pope and a king. Yeah, in in um, in the Dar al-Islam, or the, 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 re, the, the domain of Islam, for lack of a better term, um, the area in which... Islam had spread and it kind of become part of what the ruling dynasty was doing. There wasn't a differentiation, it, right? You, there was a um, because they didn't have there wasn't and and again like there's probably more than this than what I'm saying, but they didn't have like um, a pope or something like that, right? Right. No. So you you the the religious structure was blended with the governing structure, and they all kind of worked together. So, anyways, he and this and this position as a cadi, by the way, is going to come into a lot of uh, use in the future for him, oh, yeah. as you'll see. Um, but like, so he is uh, he is a uh, he grows up in this like family that's like a, it's a it's a family that's been around for a long time. They're a well known family, um, and they, he's had he, other members of his family go on to be judges, and he, he comes from a, a line of, of judges and people involved in governing and stuff. And so he um, his education probably looks a lot like. He goes and he goes to a mosque. They didn't have any madrasas in, in Tangiers at the time, from what I understand. Um, madrasas being like these schools of, of Islam, essentially. Um, I'm not totally Islamic university. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I think they have a different meaning today than they did then. I don't know, but there was no university as such in Tangiers. There was, you know, so he'd go to a mosque or whatever, and he would meet um, with a uh, a scholar of some sort. The scholar 
your base, your education basically looked like you know sitting around in a circle, listening to this guy recite a book, learning the book yourself, and then listening to this guy expound upon his interpretation or the interpretation he was taught of the book. It was not a liberal education in in, in the sense that there wasn't a lot of emphasis on all right now take this and innovate on it. It was like now take this and this is the knowledge, right? So. Right. The knowledge that he got was the knowledge. There, there, what, there might be other knowledge in the world, but it wasn't his job to um, expound on it in any other way than what he'd already learned. Well, oh, right. Sense. Well, I mean, the, the, the Quran is specifically the recitation. I mean, that's, that's what it translates as. And, um, I mean, it was a recess, re, recitation from the angel Gabriel. So yeah. you, didn't, you didn't add on to yeah. that. I mean, that's God's word. Yeah. You, you don't mess with that. Unchanged, unbroken. Yeah, and the, then that moves on, and that that kind of tradition, I guess, like probably went on to influence the way in which they studied other texts as well, as right. the ways in which these scholars studied other texts as well. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I think is important to talk about in terms of um, his upbringing was just like so around the time this is happening, and this is also going to be a trend in Ibn Battuta's travels, is that Ibn Battuta finds himself. Uh, growing up in a world very much in flux. What had just happened in the uh, in An- Andalusia, which was basically outside of Baghdad, which had, had been taken about 100 years or so prior. Andalusia, uh, Cordoba, essentially, um, but there's a bunch of other cities in Andalusia, which is Muslim Spain, um, was like this intellectual center of uh, or intellectual place uh, of of islam and uh, or of the of the the, the the empire of islam essentially or the islamic um yeah, sphere yeah, of influence yeah. anyway um it had been beaten to shit by the reconquista of these christian uh kings and and lords in spain and these like mini crusades to kick out the Muslims from Spain. Yeah, this is really when Spain actually comes on to the playing field in mm-hmm. Europe itself. They get some land by yeah. kicking a bunch of Muslims out. There are the uh, Ara, Aragon, uh, the kings of Aragon and Castile and that kind of stuff. Um, Aragorn? Yeah. Aragorn? Yeah. Aragorn, <laughs> Strider, uh, <laughs> the uh, the riders of Rohan. I don't know. They're all there. Um, but anyway, so this is all going on there. And so all of these Muslim inter- intellectuals have to go somewhere, and a lot of them end up in North Africa. Right. Um, in, and, you know, again, this is conjecture, right? This is us assuming, based on what was going on around, that this happened. But, like, there's a, a fair chance that a lot of this intellectual life bled into the upbringing in which uh, Ibn Battuta was able to have, because all of these intellectuals had to have some place to go, and so some of this knowledge found its way to um, Tangier. Yeah, and almost in a way that it, it couldn't have helped to not be that. Because um, I was in the documentary, that, one of the documentaries I was watching, um, the guy was looking from um, Ibn Battuta's hometown, and you could literally see Spain. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was just, it was across the way. Yeah. So, I mean, if you were running away from these Spanish, you know, conquerors, you you stopped there first, yeah. You know because yeah, that's a safe port and you can see it, yeah. You know so so I mean that there's definitely an influx of that way. I mean not to say that every one of them went there, but without a doubt. So. Yeah, I mean historically too, North Africa and all these other places in the Mediterranean were very much like connected. So yeah, we find ourselves in Tangiers, uh, young Ibn Battuta. Um, I want to give you because Ibn Battuta is the name we know him by. Um, his actual name. Is a lot longer than that. It's a lot longer, and I'm going to tell you it because fuck it, I can go as long as I want in this thing. Right. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> um, uh, Abu Abdallah Muhammad ibn Abdallah ibn Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al Lawati ibn Batuta. That was his full name. Ibn meaning son of. And uh, al Lawati, Lawati is a reference to his, basically, that's like his family name, where his family comes from. Um, you'll see um, Al Maghrib, um, Al Andalus. Uh, like I don't, I don't know about Al Andalus, but you'll see these little Al place names after people's names, and that's I never knew that. But from what I understand from the from what I've read, it's like that's a reference to where your family comes from. 
right? Oh, so, so it's like from. Yeah, no. from this place. Right, right, um, right. And it like, becomes kind of like your family name over like, time, I think. Like Da Vinci, Leonardo yeah. from Vinci. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought that was really cool. And yeah, another, I mean, one of the cool things about reading this stuff has been, you know, if I can digress a little bit, which I can because it's our fucking podcast. <laughs> Mystery. <laughs> um <laughs> One of the cool things has been just, like, all this stuff I just didn't know. Like, I never knew, like, Ibn meant son of, and now I know it. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it's just all these little things that I, I wasn't aware of um, that I learned over I the really course of reading this guy's book. I really wasn't aware how together Islam really had their whole empire going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you know, one of the things I want to clarify is there was a point where there was an is- Islamic caliphate that was united. This is past that point. At this right. point, we have various Islamic empires yeah, like yeah, yeah. nation not not nation states in the sense that they weren't really created over ethnic lines but you had um like domains that were fighting each other a right. king of a domain and they all happened to be islamic and so then they had this common cultural strain going through them right but yeah like so you had the man and we'll talk about it the, the the mamluks in in uh egypt and syria you have the um the Mongols, like the Mongol uh, descendants or whatever, uh, Khans and Ilkhans, and uh, they were there. There's the Golden Horde up in in Central uh, Central Asia. I want to say like um, there's all these like little things. They're all Islamic, but they're not all part of the same Islamic empire. Right. That's no longer the case. Um, but anyways, so. Back to Ibn Battuta's beginnings. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, so let's start over. Yeah. So Ibn Battuta, born 1304, has a much longer name than what we actually refer to him as because it would take a long time to say it every time we needed to say it. Um, he grows up in this educated class in uh, in uh, Tangiers, which, like any other place in this time period, and even today, there is a class of people who are educated and there's a class of people a much bigger class of people who are not, who we don't really know a lot about. Right. Because they didn't write, you know what I mean? And so that's... Hard to write your story. Yeah, exactly. So Ibn Battuta is, be- is very much um, a uh, an outlier in terms of um, the broader population, but he is, like, um, very much a part of a, of a connected um, commonality of... Uh, upper class people throughout the, well, the Dar al Islam because the scholars and it like it's it's no longer one central Islamic empire but everyone is Muslim inside of you know this this long stretch of land that because he is a scholar of this it you know his his reputation in that literally precedes him wherever yeah. he goes and so he's not just a commoner who's you know going sightseeing this is a man who has clout. He's not royalty, you know, so, but he is a man of note, you know, even before he goes anywhere, he's already a man of note. Yeah. And then that's going to, again, like that whole, him being a Qadi, this judge is going to really improve his abilities to travel. And it's really, you know, you wonder how you would finance a, 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 a trip like this. (laughs) And like today it'd be like, oh, you have to have a shit ton of money to spend on airfare and yeah. stuff and like the university of florida is paying for you to do this or yeah whatever. yeah basically this guy gets it because he is a respected dude and he's useful to all rulers he goes and sees and, and as has. we'll see people are just throwing money at him yeah. the whole time yeah and so he has he kind of has a, a job that he can do anywhere he goes and so like it makes it him able to right you know have an income wherever he ends up and be able to finance his travels um so he leaves from Morocco ostensibly to go on the Hajj, which is what he does. But um, you were going to see it, it turns into a much bigger thing than that. Um, he takes um, – oh, one of the other things I want to mention, he is a Sunni Muslim. Sunnis being the, the much bigger portion of, um, of Muslims. Sunnis and then Shia being the Shia being the minority. Um, specifically, he's a, a member of the the Maliki school of like law. Essentially, there's four different schools of law in Islam, or or it might just be in Sunni Islam. I'm not really sure, but or at least the time, yeah, yeah, at the time. And he's part of this Maliki school, which is going to come into play when he gets to like Egypt and stuff, because those are both those are also Maliki influ- influenced places. Um, and he's he's really interested in Sufism, and Sufism is like mystical. It gets it gets termed as mystical Islam, but one of the, what I read is like basically Sufism is the idea that like you can, um, you can reach God by your own 
efforts, essentially. Like, you personally can have a connection with God. Right. And, um, you know, through the, the Quran and through um, religious, like, devotion, but, like, you know, it's 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 the it's the thing that inspires people to be aesthetics, right? It's the thing that people inspire. Or even to uh, later ignorance. on, he meets up with whirling dervishes. Yeah, which is another way that they were trying to do that. Exactly, yeah. and it's like it's like all about this personal making this personal connection with God, and it's less. Um, I, I can't. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's frowned upon. Yeah, by by general Islam. So yeah, and at the end of the day, these are these are the guys who are yeah, they're your. Um, so you're outliers. Mystics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mystics yeah, yeah. is the term we throw around a lot. Right. They're not, they, they, um, they look to be less a part of the society of men and more of a part of, of the divine, I suppose would be a good way to define it. And if I'm getting that wrong, I apologize to anybody who subscribes to Sufism, right. you know, or right. whatever. <laughs> um, but, uh, so he, uh, so his, his journey is going to be this kind of like, um, He's going to leave from... Well, I'll just tell you. I'm, I'm just going to go with the narrative. So he leaves from um, Tangiers, and he stops at all these places in the Maghreb. The Maghreb being the, um, the basically North Africa before Egypt. So the Maghreb is like uh, your modern states, uh, or your modern countries of uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, um, I think. That kind of stuff. Yes. Uh, and he goes through there, and he reaches... He joins a Hijaz caravan, um, and... Because uh, it's very dangerous to travel by yourself. Right. And um, the Sultan of the of Arabia at the time um, financed those. Yeah. He so wanted people to come. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the other thing I, I I find really interesting about this whole thing is there's this whole strain of like charity. Charity. Like these rulers are. There's always a place for poor pilgrims to get food and um, sustenance and like we, find some place to travel and like get at least in pursuit of the of the Hajj. Right. There's this like infrastructure to, if you don't have the money, it's, it's probably not easy, but it's, it's available to you. Well, like we said in the podcast last time of the five pillars, one of them being charity, the other one being one of the other ones being the Hajj. The charity specifically was also, um, charity in general, but very much specifically to travelers. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he definitely, and, and, you know, uh, Batuta very much like, receives that like you can see that in his travels right like people really dig the fact that he's been a lot of different places and want and, and want to help him right um so he goes his first like major stop i guess that we would that i i recognized i guess is alexandria um it's a good place yeah it's, it's a, he really liked it he was very <laughs> impressed he saw the the lighthouse of alexandria uh which had fallen in disrepair by that time but still pretty impressive that it was around in the 1300s um uh, the pillar of columns, which is uh, Pompey's pillar. Um, so he uh, he saw these like kind of like it's just really interesting this this connection between the ancient um, Roman world and the ancient Greek world and this modern or more this medieval uh, Moroccan traveler. I don't know. I thought that was an interesting um, what's the word contrast, you know? Right. And uh, and the fact that those things are still like he's traveling traveling in the footsteps of these other people who have like, you know, thundered through history. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, he meets a guy in Alexandria by the name of Burham al Dean the Lame. And I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong because my writing is very terrible and looking at my notes. But um, he meets this guy and he's a Sufi aesthetic essentially, um, which is again like a, a trend in his, in his travels. But this guy talks about a brother he has in India and a brother he has in China. And he... Um, I don't know if it's this guy or the next guy who gives him his twelve coins, which are going to play a role in the future. But um, this, you know, this this Burham Al Din the Lame, he gives him um, he gives him this basically this talk and is like, you should go meet my brother in India and China. And then he meets another guy, um, Abdu Abdallah Al Mashadi, um, who basically gives him this prophecy saying, you're going to travel the world and see all this cool stuff and uh, and. Um, so then Ibn Battuta gets on a boat and goes down the Nile, and he really likes the Nile a lot. Um, he thinks it's a really cool river, I guess. He, t- he comments on all the cool shit that's going on as Everything he travels. Everything I've always read and heard from all the stuff, no one said anything bad to say about the Nile. <laughs> kind of want to go to the Nile now, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I feel like hippopotamuses are dangerous. Right. Uh, um, 
Stay in the and boat. crocodiles. Yeah, stay in the boat if you're ever on the Nile. History is mystery the... coming out with more advice. <laughs> <laughs> stay on. We're we're firmly in favor. Don't, of staying don't on rock the boat. the boat. Don't rock the boat, on the, especially on the Nile. Um, he. Uh, this is something I found interesting. He talks about this story about uh, where the pyramids came from. Right. Again, another one of these like ancient things that exists in the world of this medieval guy who's like seeing this stuff. With, like, like, I don't know. I just find it so cool when like. People who we're learning about in history see things that are history to them. It's just such an interesting thing right. to me, right? Um, well, that also gives the reference of exactly how old these pyramids are. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. to him, they're ancient still. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's crazy. Like, to think that something that's ancient to us is ancient to this guy who lived 700, you know, 800 years ago. Like, that's pretty wild. Right. Um, but so he talks about this guy by the name of Hermes who supposedly led to the pyramids being built as a way to store knowledge uh, for the people to have after this great flood was coming. So there's a good like flood reference in there for you. Um, and Hermes, that guy has a whole... Were they aliens? Yeah, ancient aliens. Ancient aliens. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Um, <laughs> God. Uh, you know, I'm just going to sidebar here. The one, the one of the most interesting things, because I never thought about this. I always thought the ancient alien things were just kooky. But they've got me, dude. But here's the thing: ancient aliens. It's actually like super offensive, right? Because think about the people they talk about ancient aliens like helping. Right. They're just like you're too stupid to do this. So yeah. What? What's? I mean, one of the things they have in common is they're not white. Right. Like no one ever blamed ancient aliens for Rome. No. Right. Or Greece. No. Or like, I mean, maybe Stonehenge. But even Stonehenge, I feel like. They pass off as like, oh yeah, they were just able to do this thing. You know what I mean? And they, like the historians are like, well, they didn't write it down, and the local people are like, no, we we did write it down. It's right here, and they're like, yeah, but you didn't write it down. It's yeah, not in English. Yeah, and we're not gonna take the time to read it. And so like <laughs> you get, I, I originally was listening to a podcast about the Easter Islands, uh -huh. and the guy who went there and like saw the big stone heads, and it's like, oh, these are aliens from you know from fucking Argentina or something. Right, right. And it's like, no, dude, like people just made these. Yeah, like we, we know how they made them. It's I don't know how they made them, but oh, I, I saw a documentary. On it. Oh, well, there you yeah. go. So yeah, people made them. Like it, you know, whether or not it was the exact people who are like there wasn't aliens. I, I hate to break it to anybody who was holding out hope. There's no aliens. It's just a racist way so that people can say that people who aren't white didn't do what they did. You right. know how you make a pyramid? And I heard this on a podcast too. Shout out to the Lesser Bonapartes. It's not slaves. Um. Well, I, I mean, but like, think about like. Like, the way a pyramid, like, because they're like, oh, there's pyramids in, you know, the Yucatan and there's pyramids in Egypt. They must be, like, no, dude, if you've ever, like, taken a pile of dirt and, like, thrown it on the ground and then put more dirt on top of it, guess what naturally forms? A, a pyramid. A pyramid, yeah. It's just the way shit falls. <laughs> like, it's gravity. Yeah. Um, like, so it just makes sense. We want to build a big building. What's the best shape? That one. Yeah, <laughs> we'll just pile things on top of each other until, it, you know. Done. Yeah. Um... But yeah, I, I well, we could go into this too. The the not the pyramids thing. It's like uh, they they have like these roller things and they put water in front of them. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like a really cool. Yeah, it wasn't slave labor either. Yeah, it because was they like, have it well documented that it was um, you had to give like so many months of service each year to the pharaoh. Yeah, exactly. So you just tripped all these people to go work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's slave labor in the sense that you couldn't say no, but like. Right. Not in the sense that that was that, your... That's all you did yeah, ever exactly. in your life. Yeah. No, no, no. You had a family. You went home. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, so the people... So he goes to Egypt, right? And big tangent about the pyramids. But he goes to Egypt <laughs> and he meets... Um, he the Egypt is ruled at the time by a group called the Mamluks. The Mamluks are... Or Mamluks or however you want to say it. The Mamluks are a um, originally Turkish slaves who were hired by the sultans of Egypt as bodyguards and as an army, they rose up and they end up taking over Egypt, becoming the ruling class. And the Mamluks are cool. Um, Don't give your enemies, enemies weapons. Yeah, I mean, s slave armies have always been confused. Like, first of all, like, yeah, dude, like, someone who you're making a slave is going to be pissed off at you. Like, right. especially if you took them from their house. Right. Like, yeah, in what world is it is it a smart idea to Happened be like... to the Romans. They're like, oh, the Germans, yeah, they, all of you are in our army now. Yeah. Like, Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Oh, now we have weapons? Yeah, fuck you. We're yeah. going to do what we want. Oh, so how do you use all, the, all of your <laughs> yeah. weapons? Okay, cool. Now we're going to kill you. Mm -hmm. right, done. <laughs> yeah. So good for the Mamluks for fucking putting it to the man, you know, for real. Um, but, like, they had this really cool – so one of the things you find in – because, you know, you get, you get these nomadic 
peoples who come in and do these, you know, shout out to the, the Mongols and the Huns and all these other people. Killing it. And they, yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and they come in, they take places over, and then what happens eventually is they acculturate and they become part of the ruling class and they take on the, you know, because they're these people who, you know, come from the steppe or they come from these very inhospitable environments and all of a sudden they're living in a place of like comfort and happiness and like Persia's pretty cool yeah and yeah. so you're like oh fuck this dude I'm not gonna ride a horse anymore like right. I want silk I'm not gonna wear like rat skins I want silk robes you know yeah. that shit feels great live in a palace yeah <laughs> or a tent or a yurt yeah mm. <laughs> um, so like what ends up happening is these people acculturate and then they're not steppe nomads anymore right they're just a ruling maybe they're a different ethnic class perhaps quote unquote but like they're you know basically for all intents and purposes this the the same people who they displaced right right um the mamelukes though make a conscious effort to like almost like uh just stay badass by continuing to import turkish slaves so they're turkish nomadic former slaves who continue to import turkish slaves to make part of the ruling class right and so then they continuously have this stream of you know badasses from the steps right who are coming in and are still hard asses and then like and who are completely loyal because they just bought them out out of slavery gave them freedom and a lot of money exactly and so you have this... you have my support if you do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so um the mamelukes avoid and they very much stay separate too from the egyptian populace right the egyptian populace and the mamelukes are two separate mm. groups and uh so it's like this aloof upper class but anyway so they're the ones and he really uh i, don't, right, I didn't so, write down so where's ibn right now Ibn's in Cairo. Okay. I'm sorry. I I don't I didn't write anything down about Cairo. So he goes to Cairo and he really likes Cairo. Cairo at the time is like a city of I think I read something of upwards of uh, over 500,000 people, pretty which big. is pretty insane. Yeah. Pretty big. I mean, that's really especially for a city at that time. Right, right. Um there's uh Europeans who go and visit there. Um, sources who talk about it being like one street in Cairo being the populace of a city, you know, right. in, in Italy. If I remember some of my rough history about about the same time, London probably has maybe fifteen thousand people. Yeah, like and it's and it's London. It's called London, but you know, something like fifteen thousand, maybe. Yeah, exactly. And so Cairo is just like it's got to be fucking awesome to behold, you know, at the time. And so like he's really into it, and he um. He uh, he likes Cairo a lot. He visits a lot of, and this whole time he's visiting these different Sufi clerics. Uh, he calls one of the books I read. They calls them saints. And I saw this thing on Amazon uh, on one of the reviews, and I love reading the reviews of books on Amazon because they're always great. But one of the reviews is by a lady who's like, "That's bullshit. There are no, you know, she didn't say bullshit, but she says that's wrong. There are no saints in Islam. This is a bad." Tris-. So I don't know if he means. If in the translation, or if it's just a reference to these people being holy men, I, right. I think that's what it is. The, the, these revered they, guys. This person probably wasn't trying to be offensive, mm-hmm. you know. Saints, yeah. In his in his vocabulary, was a was a nice word. Yeah, exactly. Know? So I, but he refers a lot. A lot of them have the title of Sheikh in front of them. Sheikh. It's pronounced S H, or it's spelled S H A I, S H, A I K H. So I pronounce it Sheikh. Um, these Sheikhs who are. Aesthetics who are um, people like holy men who maybe lead congregations or whatever, but they're they're Sufi uh, holy men, and he visits a lot of them. He visits a lot of these different shrines to these guys or, or or burial places or whatever of these guys, and talks to a lot of different cool dudes who tell him cool stuff. Um, and in Cairo, he does a little bit of learning. I think there's um, there's a lot of universities or there's a lot of learning going on there. Uh, again, you know, benefiting from. Yeah. Being, and benefiting from that Andalusian brain drain kind right, of. Right, right. Um, and, you know, Cairo also has, like, Europeans and all these other people in it, too. So it's, like, this very... Yeah, I mean, again, like you were saying, from Alexandria, I mean, people have been visiting there since Greek times. So, I mean, there's just massive conglomerate. I mean, Egypt has basically been, you know, the crossroads of the Mediterranean up mm-hmm. until that point. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, he really likes Cairo. He goes on to Syria. He visits Gaza, Hebron, Jerusalem. Um sees the sites there, you know, various holy shrines and things like that. Right. Um, he, uh, he goes on to Tripoli in, um, and, you know, one of the things, the reason I mentioned that is in, in Tripoli, I just, this is one of the places I noticed, but he talks about like these, these trade routes that happen essentially, like these places that produce this thing and they send it back to this place. Right. You know, so, um, he loves to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. He's really into uh, trade and and that's another cool thing, you know, about this whole thing is like just the interconnectedness of all these places. Right. Like, um, we talk about globalization now and whatever, but like there is definitely 
um, global trade going on. By the roots of it were then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He goes on to Damascus. Um, he relates a story in Damascus about Damascus where there's a ba- there's a plague happening. He says it's while he's there, um, so I don't know. But like this plague is happening, and no, the it way- was the time of the great. Of the Great Plague. It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's there during the Great Plague. And the way that Damascus manages to have less casualties than these other places from the plague is um, the the sultan or the, the emir of Damascus uh, basically calls on all the people, Christians, Jews, Muslims, to pray. And, you know, the Christians come out with, like, their scripture and the Jews come out with their books, their their Torah or I don't – I can't remember what he calls it. I think he just calls it their laws. And um, – the Muslims, you know, come out reciting the Quran, and then they all get together and they all pray at the big mosque, and then the you know casualties are like you know cut by three quarters or something like that. They have unity, a lot less man. unity. I mean, I thought that was a cool story just because it was like a story of people all working together in right. this time where we definitely don't think about people working together, right? <laughs> Especially religions. these three religions. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the big three aren't uh, you know typically aren't aren't portrayed as getting along, especially in the medieval times. Um, he gets to Mecca, right? He makes his way to Mecca to go on the actual pilgrimage, the, the ostensible purpose of this whole thing. Um, one of the things that he comments on during his trip to Mecca, which is in the middle of the desert, by the way. Yeah. So it's like very inhospitable terrain to get there. Well, that's um, why the, it was big because there was there was a spring there, mm-hmm. you know. Exactly. And, and that's, spring. that's the one of the things – I mean you see these places that grow up, the, the cities he refers to. Um, the, the, the establishments, it all had, it's all based on water, right? Access yeah. to water. Yeah. Where the places get water, how they have water. There's places with cisterns. There's places that like, you know, it's, it's all it's all based on water. Um, he takes part in the various parts of the Hajj, which you know, when I think of the Hajj, I always thought of like just Mecca. But like, there's a there's you go to this, you go to one town for this, you go to another town for this. There's all these little rituals you do on the way. Yeah. Um, he he visits a place called Tabuk, uh, Taiba. Al Medina, which is Medina, I'm pretty sure, and and he goes to Mecca. He really likes the people in Mecca. He thinks they're pretty good people, um, which is good because I mean, like that's that's their Mecca, that, you know, like Islam. You yeah. know, I mean, like it's it's good. That you would hope that the people in yeah, Mecca. Are good. I mean, I mean, he likes it so much he goes back several times. Couple so times. <laughs> obviously, obviously he digs it. Um, and so from Mecca he goes on to southern Persia and Iraq, um, which these areas are both ruled by a. Uh, descendants of the mongols which again is really interesting because he he mentions genghis khan um by the name of um tankies he calls him um a couple times and he's you know he calls him the accursed tankies like he doesn't like him but these people who are the descendants of him are now the muslim rulers of these places and he doesn't have issues with them i think there's one guy who says he's a shitty ruler but like for the most part he like likes them all and it's like you know, just accepts. And that's, you know, it's a good example of how these, you know, these Mongol foreigners, which a lot of them by the time they reached this place, they actually were actually Turks. So a lot of them were Turks. Right. Um, they weren't actual ethnic Mongols. Uh, they uh, are, they're just part of, you know, the ruling class of that area now. And they've just become, you know, Iraqis and Persians. And I don't know about Iraqis and Persians, but they've become. I don't know. Whatever it was that time. Yeah, exactly. At the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He travels through the lands in the Marsh Arabs, which if you don't know about the Marsh Arabs, really interesting culture. Check them out. They build like these really cool structures out of reeds. Um, they live in this like really inhospitable. It's not a thing I knew. Marsh yeah. Marsh Arabs. Marsh Arabs. Um, Saddam they... Hussein killed a lot of them, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, Saddam Hussein killed a lot of people, but okay. he wasn't. Was that the um, Was that the Kurds? Like mm-hmm. modern day Kurds? Okay, no. No, different than the Kurds. Right. These um, they're it's really interesting though. If you look up pictures online, they have really cool, really cool stuff. Um, Into that, yeah. Um, he meets a hermit in a place called Abaddon. Uh, the only reason I mentioned that is this: it's basically like one of his first experiences with like mystical stuff happening. Like he meets this guy, and this guy tells him, you know, he gives him his blessing, and he prays with him, and he gives him his blessing, and then, um. Batuta goes back and tells those boys like, hey, yo, I met this guy over here. He's really awesome. Let's go see him. And then they go back and he's gone. You know, the guy's gone. And it's like, yeah. But if Batuta makes a point to say like, after he blessed me, all of my dreams have been fulfilled and I've been really happy. So right. like, there's that. Um, he meets this alcoholic sultan, uh, Sultan Adabuk, uh, Afra... Bad handwriting on my part. I can't. I don't know what the end Adabek. of it is. Adabek. Adabek. So we're just going to go with Adabek. Um, yeah. And he's an alcoholic. 
and uh, killing it. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, he's living the dream, I suppose. Um, which you know, I, if I was a if I was a ruler back then, you know, fuck, dude, I'm like, doing that all <laughs> yeah. day. Yeah. Who's gonna stop you, really? But Ibn Batuta, I don't know about if he stops him, but Ibn Batuta is the first guy he walks in, and this is the first like. Ibn Battuta party pooper moment. Right. He walks in, he's like... Which there's lots of. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Ibn Battuta, huge party pooper. Like, <laughs> if you are having a good time, Mr. Battuta not has a problem. Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> not He's not into it. Get back to the mosque, or wherever, you know, wherever you're supposed to be. Um, he reproaches this guy. So this Ibn Battuta, who's this sultan, has never met before, meets the sultan for the first time and says... Oh man, you'd be a really great guy. Your dad was really awesome, but you're a drunk. And and <laughs> and, and then uh, he meets him in the company of this emir. And as he's leaving, he realizes he forgets his sandals, and he's very embarrassed. And so the emir goes back and gets his sandals and brings him back. And Ibn Batuta's like, "Oh, you know, I'm sorry I said that, maybe or whatever. Thank you so much and for bringing my sandals." And the emir's like, "Listen." You're the only person who has told our sultan that he's a drunk and thank you. you thank know? you. Yeah, thank you. And you're the only one who could say it. So know? Ibn Battuta party pooper actually has a good part to him because maybe, you know, maybe Adebek got his shit together. I don't know. Maybe he didn't. We didn't it doesn't go into it, but you know doesn't talk about it. Let's say he does. Mm-hmm. Um in uh so he travels on to a place called Ish uh Ishfahan, uh where he meets this guy named Sheikh Katab Al Din Hassan. Uh he's a Sufi. Um, and he's talking to this guy and he's like, man, you say really good stuff. Like, can I have your cloak? And like the cloak that he's wearing is like this cloak that's been passed down to him by his Sufi forebearers, like his father and grandfather and stuff. And right. this big, long line of succession, which Ibn Battuta makes sure to write down like, oh, this is who had it before him. This is who had it before him. And so Ibn Battuta never met this guy before. Isn't a d- devout Sufi at all. Like right. he's just like interested in them, but he's kind of like. He's like kind of doing the uh, the um, the Timothy Leary uh, Harvard like like India tour like I'm gonna go find myself kind yeah, of tour sure. of the yeah, Sufis yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> like he's like oh man these guys are really cool but I don't really know if I want to give up cheeseburgers you know what I mean or whatever <laughs> like but uh, he uh, he like he's like oh can I have your cloak and the guy gives him his cloak and he's like oh. Your cloak is so nice. Can I also have your skull cap? And he gives him his skull cap. And so then now Ibn Batuta has a fancy cloak and a skull cap. Um, he goes on to a place called Shiraz, which he really digs, and then gets to Baghdad. And he starts off by talking about Baghdad as being, like, a very important city. But then he's like, there's nothing to see. There's nothing beautiful there besides the river. Um, probably a reference to the fact that Baghdad, you know, this is this is at least 100 years after the Mongol sack in Baghdad, which I was talking to Jeremiah about earlier. Um, one of the things I feel like I read, I played a lot of Age of Empires as a kid. Right. And there's a there's a, um, a campaign where you're the Mongols, and I'm pretty sure you take Baghdad. And there's this, this part that always sticks out to me that talks about um, the rivers running red with blood and, uh, and black with ink from all the books that the Mongols threw into the river. Good um, lord. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. And you were saying, you were telling me earlier that, like, all the buildings were kind of just destroyed too, which, if you think about that, that took months, maybe even years to do. Because I mean, they they built these things out of sandstone, and you're like they, these were impressive things. Baghdad was a massive city, you know. So for them to walk in or come in and just try and destroy this city, it wasn't just you know setting stuff on fire because they had wood buildings. Yeah. You know, they had shifts. You know, guys took breaks. And then came back with a hammer and just kept pounding these things away, you know? Like To they, give you an idea, and like, really I don't know as much about the, this. yeah, I don't know about, as much about the actual destruction of the city, but again, side note, and uh, and podcast shout out, Dan Carlin has a really good uh, uh, series on the cons, and in one of them, he describes the way in which they would go about um, killing people, right? So, like, what you do is you, you know, this town that, that, that doesn't that doesn't immediately submit to you. You go in and you serve you you assign one guy to ten people and say you're going to cut off all the heads of these people and one guy out of your army for each ten people and that's how you kill thousands of people efficiently. In a place. Yeah, is just you just delegate responsibility. Good God, yeah, it's insane. <laughs> I mean the the Mongols. It's yeah, it's fucking crazy. Efficient. Um, still, I mean like yeah, it's it's yeah, and how yeah, I don't know. I think that that's I mean. I haven't really heard anybody else described as a horde, you know, and that's 
That's probably why. You know, that's... and I was reading horde actually doesn't mean as like we have. It's like a scary term now, right? But horde is like, comes a from a large different... group of. Like, it's, I think it's so. Just, yeah, like, a, like an that. amount of people. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like it's very. It's a very like. Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm like I don't want chill I don't term. Want, I don't want to face like a, a horde of frogs yeah no no yeah now her horde's a bad thing right thanks mongols <laughs> thanks. you ruined horde for everybody um <laughs> but yeah the mongols fucked baghdad up and so the since baghdad is, is all jacked up now um it's not the place it was going to be or the, it's not the place that it was you know 100 years ago or during the uh the, like the the high point of the islamic caliphate which is like i want to say the 800s 900s um ad a, a, a C E, however you want to say it. Um, but uh, so the place is now run by Khans, right? Who are these descendants of Genghis Khan or the the Khan, the Khans people who came there? And uh, but you know, again, it's like this. All right, well, you know, now they're the guys. So like, and they're Muslims. So you know, the people who did this are a separate group than the people when which they're actually not. But like, there's. There's no animosity, it doesn't sound like, on the part of Ibn Battuta, at least, towards the people who are now ruling this place. He kind of just accepts that they're, like, now the rulers. Right. Um, he's not like, oh, the, you know, the usurpers or anything. They're just, like, they're they're the people now. Well, and they're the people that came in and tore Baghdad up. I'm not going to run in waving a flag telling them how bad they are either. Yeah, that's a good point, too. You probably don't want to <laughs> talk shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and then, so, he goes through Baghdad, and after Baghdad, he goes back to Mecca for three years. And then he spent three years in Mecca. And in that time, he, you know, studies religion and he uh, is basically like... It's a good place. Probably religion. teaches some classes maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Um, works on his book. I, he actually doesn't work on his book. No. He didn't, in, did we talk about the fact that, like, I don't think we mentioned the fact that this is... He doesn't write this book. This no. is a book that is written by a guy named right, right, right. Uh, Ibn Juze, um, who is an Andalusian scholar who... Uh, Ibn Battuta later on relates his story too under the direction of the Sultan of Morocco. Um, yeah, so even in the Rila, there's a lot of flowery poetry mm -hmm. that he wanted to put in there, not Batuta, uh, Jize okay. wanted to put in there. So, like, there's all this poetry about stuff, and all of the poetry stuff is um, Jize's in, imagination in his own head writing that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's like. Um, when, uh, yeah, like a politician today writes a book, but someone else writes it for them. Ghost and they kind of, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you say ghost writer. Um, who that, uh, yeah, that guy I was reading, he's like, I don't know if, it, it, I think he only lived into his 30s though. It's actually kind of depressing. Like I'm pretty sure he, Ibn Juze died pretty soon after he did this. His one claim to fame was writing was down. Writing down what someone else did. so awesome story. <laughs> Which, you know, whatever. I mean, you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. Right. Um, so then he travels after he spent three years in Mecca, you know, like getting, in, getting, getting right with, uh, with himself and finding himself or whatever. I don't know. Getting right with God. Getting right with God. Yeah. yeah. He, um, he goes and on a tour of basically the Arabian Sea of, uh. East Arabia, or Southern Arabia, East Africa, and the Arabian Gulf. Uh, he visits Yemen. Um, he meets a, 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 he goes to a place called Adan, where there's a group of Indian merchants, like a merchant's quarter almost, in Adan, which I thought was interesting. Again, like that globalization thing. Right. Very much like kind of happening. Um, at least inter-Asian, you know. Picks um, up, picks up a Yemeni confectioner. Oh, yeah. So that's going to come into play, and play later. Yeah, 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 He doesn't talk about that. Right. Yeah, but um, yeah, but it he comes must... into play later. He yeah. picks up a uh, a guy who makes candies. Yeah, candies well. and 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 sweets. Candy is dandy, and so he picks up this confectioner, which he doesn't talk about. And this is the other thing is like, okay, so this may or may not have already happened, and the reason why I don't mention it is because Ibn Battuta or Ibn J uh, Juze spends like a sentence on saying it but like he's gotten married once i think already right so um and he's gonna get married quite a few times after this yes um and he picks up various slaves uh both boys and girls concubines yeah um yeah and so there's he's very much a man of his time quote unquote you know which is the thing we say whenever people do shit that's like which for as prudish as he is towards other people i mean like Maybe the, like the multiple marriages thing is okay in as a uh, according to his law. I don't think the concubine thing would be. I right? think it's chill though. I think it's chill because, I mean, I don't know. This is con again conjecture. Like I don't, I don't because know. Because masculine society. 
Yeah, I mean it's patriarchy, right? right you know, for sure. like and uh, don't get me on feminism, bro. I will go <laughs> off Let's on some do feminism. Dude. Yeah, killing it. Yeah, uh, history, mystery, feminism podcast. Yeah, we uh, are coming soon. Definitely pro feminism. <laughs> He didn't like the sailors he was with. He was on this boat for a long period of time. He didn't really like the sailors. They uh, slaughtered food the wrong way, and uh, so he had to survive. Uh, they weren't they weren't killing the the meat the right way. Um, so he ate uh, dried dates and fish for most of the trip. Um, and he basically island hops around these little areas in, in the co- off the coast of Africa and, and um, southern Arabia. Um, he. So there's this there's this part where he's on the boat and they're in an area where they're trying to land but they can't land and, and he either gets pissed off and is just like drop me off here or something like that you know like you do when you're on a bus and they miss your stop and they don't right. they won't stop Let me off. like I'm I'm done with this and Actually, so he gets and, off and I heard in um, another documentary this one guy who's given a whole lecture on Ibn Battuta unfortunately for him he does a lot of sailing and it's unfortunate because he actually hated sailing. Mm-hmm. He got sick all the time on boats. You know, he was just easily, you know, uh, got seasick. And uh, but unfortunately for for where he was going with his travels, had to go by boat. It's a bummer. Yeah, yeah it's gotta be. It's gotta suck if you don't like sailing. I'm not a big boat person either. Um, right, which is weird considering the place we live. But Florida, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, in like coastal Florida, you know. But right. Like, uh, I'm not huge on them, so I just don't go on them. But I don't like again, going to the beach, and I mean it's. It's 20 minutes away, depending on where you're going, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but anyway, Ibn Battuta doesn't like boats. He especially doesn't like the sailors he's with. So he gets off the boat. It's like, fuck you guys. And uh, he brings this guy with him who he hires as a guide. The guide ends up, like, trying to kill him and his friend who he's with. Um, Bad choice. Yeah, but he, you know, they don't really have another choice, I suppose, so they keep him. But Ibn Battuta's solution is, I'm just going to, like, show this guy that I have a spear that I'll kill him with if he tries to kill me. He's not going to take he if he thinks the object of this this guy this guy trying to kill them is trying to take his fancy clothes he's carrying with him and um, which maybe it's the fancy robe and skull cap right, I don't know right but um he uh, get your his, own Sufi cap yeah his his, <laughs> his uh, solution is he just stays up all night just watching this guy sleep. Um, Probably looking like, kind of crazy the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. He's. As, <laughs> I don't know. You know. Good on Ibn Battuta for being able to be up for like twenty four hours in a row without the use of stimulants. While you know on what I mean? the move in the desert. Yeah. Exactly. You know, um, in the Middle East. He least. was really, really committed. Um, he goes to Oman, and Oman apparently is just like a big fuck fest at the time. Uh, like in se- in the sense that like he relates the story of this woman going to the Sultan of Oman and being like. Hey, I have the devil inside of me, which is obviously code for like, you know, she's a girl who wants to have sex, which she likes to get down. And Ibn Battuta's, you know, world is like, oh, you know, she's bad. Um, And uh, and that's the thing is like, you know, this this narrative and not not judging Ibn Battuta because what's the point? He's dead. But like this is very much like women are either debauched or they're, uh, you know. Models of super pious, yeah, yeah. Models of piety. There's not a lot of in the middle with him, right? And if they're in the middle, they're just not mentioned because they're just, you know, like with his wives. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, he him him seeing this with whether or not he saw it or not, like him seeing this is like, oh, the women in this place just they, you know, whenever they feel the need, they go to the sultan and tell them, I, you know, I want to be carnal, and then they go off and be carnal with whoever they want, and the fathers and brothers can't kill them, like. And Darn. if they do, yeah, if they do, they're killed by the Sultan's men, which, you know, again, like, is really a problem for him. And so then he goes to Bahrain, and I guess because he's become, um, his, 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 uh, scruples are so insulted by the, uh, the, the, the sneaky guide and the people in Oman and those damn sailors, he goes back to Mecca to go spend some time. Um, he's got to regroup. He's got to regroup and get his shit together. You, you know? know? <laughs> um, he goes back to a happy place, which, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I don't know. He uh, he probably visits Mecca more times than most people today visit Mecca, right? I would assume. So good right. for him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being so, like, uh, committed to getting back there. Um, but Ibn Battuta cannot, his his travel itch has not been scratched. No, enough. not He's even. He's still got so many, so much, so many itches left oh, to yeah. scratch. And so he, um, he, uh, Travels to the steppe, man. He travels to uh, Eastern Europe, 
Anatolia specifically, Anatolia being modern day uh, Turkey. Yeah. Um, so he almost gets on a ship that that he later finds out sinks. So it's like divine, you know, intervention, and he's like very happy about it. Um, he gets on a ship with the Genoese, which are Italians. They're he calls them, you know, they're all Christians, and so, but he says they treat him very nicely, and you know, they don't even make him pay for his trip. So good for That's I guess. Pretty chill. Yeah. yeah, Genoese are good people. Good job on um, the Italians. The the place he goes to is called Bilad Al Rum. That's how he refers to Anatolia and the area in which he's traveling. Um, Al Rum being obviously a reference to Rome. Which again, right. I love. I, I just I think that's so cool. Like this thing that we think of as ancient, which is ancient to him, you know, like this bleed over into right. He's like, oh wow, Rome. Yeah. that's so cool. How mm-hmm. old that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and he really likes the Bilad Al Room. He he thinks it's the best land ever. Um, women don't wear veils there. So he's like very much on the peripheries now of like the Islamic frontier, and so like. The um, hardcore kind of um, traditionalism is kind of breaking down as you get into these areas where you're blending cultures. You know what I mean? Well, a I mean, bit he's, more. he's straight up in Christendom now. Well, it's Christendom ruled by Turkey, right? Or right. ruled by Turks. Like, this is a Muslim conquered area that is still very Christian populated. Right. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they smoke hashish there. So, you know, that's exciting for them. Um, he meets this group called the Akis. And the Akis are going to play an important part because these are the guys who, throughout his travels in the steppe area, are going to be the ones that are taking him in. And these are like basically, you could think of like a trade guild, but they're like not really necessarily trade guild, but they're unmarried men who are like then a you know maybe like the Masons, maybe you think of or like um, I don't know some sort of social group today, fraternities maybe. I think a fraternity would be a good way, good way right. to describe them. They're guys who get together and party and have a good time, and then they help travelers like this guy. But these guys, like, there's even a point where, where two groups of them, like, fight over who's going to, like, you know, be the ones that host this guy. Um, but it's a cool, they're, like, cool little, like, I mean, it sounds like a very cool thing. They're, like, people who help other people, which is cool. He uh, buys, oh, he yells at a, a Jewish physician. He meets in a court of a sultan whose name I forget. Um, so many sultans. Yeah, there's a lot of sultans. And so, yeah, me I and Jeremy are talking down. about this. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's no point in writing them down um, after a while because there's a lot of people that he meets and a lot of sultans. And all there. of them have like, you know, I thought some of the names that are in America were long. You know, like yeah. I got a I got a buddy named Corn. He has five names. Mm-hmm. Like these guys have like seven or eight names. Like, you know, like <laughs> word long names. Like, no, no. Mm-mm. Yeah, I'm not going to remember that. I'm gonna, I mean, that's why we call Ibn Battuta Ibn Battuta. Right. right? I'm just going to butcher the pronunciation. Yeah. Like, no, nope. Mm-hmm. Um. He, uh, he yells – and the reason why I mentioned the Jewish physician is like this is another Ibn Battuta party pooper. Uh, this Jewish physician guy comes in and is talking to the sultan and then he goes and sits down in the same – either above or in the same place as like the Quranic readers in the in the courtroom or whatever. And um, you know Ibn Battuta – someone says, oh, yeah, that guy is a, a Jew or whatever and Ibn Battuta like goes off on him and um, calls him some mean names and uh, you know – and then he leaves, and, and it's the same kind of thing as before, where he calls the one, uh, the sultan, the, the other sultan drunk or whatever. He, uh, his uh, Namir pulls him aside afterwards and is like, "Hey, thanks for saying that because we've always wanted to tell him that, but you know, none of us have been able to, you know." Right. Um, and the the writer that I, I read um, in uh, the book, The Adventures of Ibn Battuta, by uh, Ross E. Dunn, he says this is probably less a um, anti. And I don't actually I don't know if it was him or if it was the other book I read, but it was less an anti-Semitic thing and probably more so like just like a you're not respecting the Quranic reader kind of right, thing. Unless you're one of the Quranic readers, don't yeah. go over there and sit with them. Yeah, exactly. So again, like Ibn Battuta party pooping um, all over the place. Uh, he then buys a slave, you know, as you do, and uh, and at this point, <coughs> I don't know if he's bought other slaves yet, but this will be a thing. He buys quite a few slaves and he comes into. Um, possession of slaves and it's just like again like a one sentence thing you know it's, it's whatever right uh for him um he gets caught in a storm at some point um oh he gets caught in a snowstorm oh yeah this is actually an interesting story so him and his group they leave from a place called bursa and they're traveling on to somewhere else and um you know his group shrinks and 
uh, expands various times throughout this this thing. So sometimes it's he's just on a long trip. Guy. I mean, some people yeah. got where they were going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They kind of got <laughs> off. So like he um he gets his group gets caught in the snowstorm <laughs> though, and he has to be the one that's like, you know, he's like, what are we gonna do? And he gets lucky. Basically, he's like, I'm gonna go look for help, and so he takes his horse and he runs away, and um, he luckily like ends up somewhere where there's people and they go and they rescue these people um that kind of just in time you know divine providence kind of thing um but in the course of this travel too he meets this sketchy dude who they hire on as i think because he can speak arabic so they hire him on and so that he can translate for them in, right um, yeah to the because he at this point he doesn't speak turkish um so he uh it's this guy who had, had made the pilgrimage at some point, so they call him Haji at some point, um, which I guess is like an appellation for someone who's made the Hajj. Right. Um, and uh, they make a joke out of like how much money this guy regularly steals from them because apparently he's a big sketchball. <laughs> like, <laughs> keeps stealing money from people in the group, and they're just like, yeah, it's Haj. You know, it's like, how, much money gonna, yeah, how much money are you going to steal from us today? In fact, I think is the actual thing. And like he does stuff like they stay with his sister, the, the, this guy's sister, and um, – they, you know, offer to pay her for letting them stay with him. And the, the guy, the pilgrim guy is like, no, nah, just give me the money. She doesn't need it, you know, and like takes the money. Like he's like a, a scumball, you know what right. I mean? Nice. And eventually they get rid of him and they move on somewhere else. And he goes to a place called Al-Karam where he meets um, kind of the big boy of this of the Turkish uh, steppe sultanate area. The Sultan Muhammad Uzbak Khan. Um he – so – well, actually, he doesn't meet the Khan there. He meets the Khan later on. He travels with one of the Khan's emirs to um, – which emir is like um, a governor kind of or like okay, – yeah. yeah. Well, um, and you have an emir. It sounds like you have an emir who governs your territory for you and then like in like a – you know, like let's say the governor city or whatever. Right. Okay. Or a, a region. Because you don't want to be bogged here. down with yeah. fear, no, bureaucracy. No, you don't want to do all of it. Yeah. No, no, no. You're um, just there to make money as the ruler. Yeah, exactly. Um so he travels with the emir to go see the Khan who's traveling in like this traveling camp basically. Um, he has a capital but he you know is going somewhere else. I don't know. So – Well, he's still descended of the Mongol people, right? Yeah, he's and there's the probably Khan, some bleed so. over from that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so I mean he's, he doesn't want to hang out in one place. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is – again, this is like the hinterland. So these guys who are ruling these places are less um, of the kind of um, – Persian, you know, a cultured, like, wearing silk type cons than the ones that are in the South, you know what I They're mean? They're getting in soft. Asia. Yeah. Yeah, these, these, these are less, these are not the soft cons. These are, these are harder cons. They're still living on the steppe land. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, riding horses and proud. shit. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, so he visits the con and the con has wives. They're called Katoons. Um, and the cartoons are important because he, with one of them, he makes a, a specific point to talking about how respectful they are to their women, um, which, you know, again, like is, you know, they, they let the woman sit down before they do, you know, like, oh man. Um, but, uh, no, he doesn't dare. You know, it's funny. He doesn't reproach, uh, Uzbek though, probably because he's a badass horse archer. Well, you he, know what I mean? Just came from Baghdad. <laughs> yeah. Again, you don't you don't talk bad to the to a group of people that will eliminate a city. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I'm sure that played a, a role in him not reproaching this guy. Oh, right? you like your women sit down. <laughs> mm, yeah, interesting. Yes, mm. very cool. I like this a lot. Um, <laughs> I like everything that you do a lot. Yeah, but he's still, you know, throughout this whole thing, the reason why he's visiting all these people again is because he's this learned guy. And there's various times where, like, you know, one guy he visits has him. Um, you know, translate a text for him or recite a text for him so that he can then translate into Turkish. Like he, he goes to this one place where he's, um, you know, they don't, they don't, no one knows Arabic there and he speaks Arabic and they're all like, oh, he knows the ancient Arabic tongue, you know? And like, right. he's like very like, oh man, this, this traveler from like, you know, like he really is, uh, knows his stuff. He's from like the heartland or whatever you right. kind of think. Yeah. That was one thing that one, uh, one of the professors said in, um, one of the documentaries I saw, he was talking about how um, where he was definitely from old world Islam. Yeah. You know, like his father was Islamic, his father was Islamic, his father, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the North Coast Africa area and, and definitely the Middle East. We're getting in, he's getting to areas now that are Islamic, but 
It's like a generate. They're like maybe less one, than one, two generations. Yeah, removed. So from here he is. Not only, not only is he a learned man, he is. You know, he's got clout. You know, and so yes, he can. He he knows the law better than anybody else. You know, because he's from this prestigious family of law. You know, knowers, and you know, so that that precedes him wherever he goes. Yeah. You know, so he's just got all this clout behind him. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's um. Trying to think of a good reference, uh, but I can't. It escapes me at the moment. He's but, like um, the Ibn Battuta. Of, <laughs> he's like the Ibn Battuta of uh, yeah, the Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta. <laughs> yeah, he's um, yeah, he's a he's a he's an important dude. But uh, so he is in this guy's lands, and he and he's oh, he's meeting with the the cartoons, and he's going along and going around and um, and kind of like uh, paying his respects to him. And the one cartoon is from. Uh, Constantinople. She's actually the daughter of the current ruler of Constantinople. Nice. Which, you know, you think of, um, this is not, you know, the Byzantine Empire, which they would have thought of themselves as the Roman Empire, I suppose, at the time. They didn't call themselves Byzantine, but um, this was not the Byzantine Empire of Justinian. This was the Byzantine Empire of, like, you know, the city-state of Constantinople. You right. know what I mean? Right, and, like, right, right. the outlying areas somewhat. It, it's slowly collapsing in on itself. And a lot of it from, you know, this this guy and the very much like, like the Mali Empire did. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but yeah, essentially slow bleed. But yeah, yeah and and yeah, exactly, and uh, and but at this point, there's obviously like good, relatively good relations between the two groups because, like, I mean, you know, this well, guy. If you're on the decline. You're not trying to start a war with anybody. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, their 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 armies. You know, Constantinople's armies are like mercenaries. You know what I mean? Yeah, they don't yeah, even yeah. have their own people fighting anymore. It's like whatever, but. Um, even even as a shadow of their former self, Constantinople still is like a big deal, right? right. For Ibn Battuta. Yeah, I mean, and even so, when it becomes Istanbul, I mean, like it's still a m- massive city of trade. Mm-hmm. You know, it just switches hands. And I feel like too, even when, like the, um, if I remember correctly, even when the Turks eventually do take it, they they have every intention of continuing the, of holding on to the mantle of Roman emperor. Like they don't they don't get rid of that. Like that's still a prestigious thing, even for That's cool. Yeah. And I and I might be bullshitting about that, but I think it's true. Like I feel like they they continue that tradition. Well, because of being that's kind of how that goes survived. back into like how amazed Ibn Tuta was by the the uh, the thought of Rome and seeing the the pyramids of like how ancient that was. Mm-hmm. And so they wanted to hold on to that too, because then that gives you even more legitimacy because you can now trace your line back to, you know, 800 BC yeah. as, you know, like the Roman emperor. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and I think, you know, the reason why, and the reason why, it's, and again, if that's bullshit, it's bullshit. I don't know. But like, there there's less of a line of a distinction than, than that we've made in the past about this, um, that I think it's made of, of between the Western world and the Muslim world and the Far East. And I think that's one of the things that this thing does a such good such a good job of showing. Right. Is like there no, there was very much like a lot of crossover and like as you got to the fringes, you know, they're very much were these border regions, much like the border regions today, you know, even between like the United States and Canada, you know, like there's there's like a crossover of people and traditions and and um well, culture, you know what I mean. You might have just said this, and I, I didn't catch it the right way. But I mean, the border between Canada and the United States, who are uh, us being in the United States, our closest, literal closest ally, you know, by um, by by land, and also, you know, and definitely in the top five of five of our friendliest allies, you know, to the United States, is harder to cross that border today than any border Ibn Battuta crossed. Yeah, that's true too. In any border, because he just he, he walked there. At most, they asked him who he was. Yeah, and that was that. Yeah, that's true, and 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 so that explains too why there's that that bleed over of culture and these bleed over of traditions and the bleed over of people, right? Like the it wasn't these they weren't they weren't separate entities. They were part of a globalized kind of thing, right? You know, Christian Christian uh, kings were spending gold from the Mali empire. You know what I mean? Like that, it, that's, it's crazy, but it's like, that's, that's the world they're living in. And so like, yeah, I don't know. There might've been, uh, idealistic differences, but at the end of the day, you know, trade's trade. Trade is trade. Yeah. And, and if you 
get a better trade relation with someone who maybe doesn't believe the same shit as you. Maybe you whatever you, know, you got pepper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> maybe you give lip, lip service to the fact that you don't believe the same things as they do, but at the end of the day, you're but sending. You find your, it very interesting. You send your daughter to go marry their con, yeah. you know, <laughs> like because it's probably a good idea. Um, well, especially the con. Yeah, exactly. Especially <laughs> the con. Um, so yeah, so getting back to Ibn Battuta, which is ostensibly the, the topic of this podcast, I don't know anymore, but uh, <laughs> he he goes to Constantinople with well, this one cool Katoom. thing about uh, to interrupt uh, again. Yeah. Uh, one cool thing about it is that the way he's writing it, it is his story, but he doesn't necessarily always make it about him. I mean, it's kind of what happened to him, but it's not he, its not a lot of self-service inside of it. We don't he, know. I mean, he doesn't describe what he looks like. Like, he doesn't describe. Yeah. Like, he's not very. In, he's very interested in saying what, what he observes. Happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he says a couple of times, like, oh, I was so lucky because of this, which he was so lucky because of these certain things. I mean, he very narrowly escapes death a bunch of times, but it's not, you know, just like, look at how cool I am kind of a thing. You know, it's, it's definitely, you know, just expository about what is going on in these empires. And so, I mean, yeah, it's just super interesting. Yeah. Um, actually speaking of that, Oh fuck. I didn't, I, I must have not written it down. Um, there is a part where he actually literally says, um, I visited this guy's. He visited some Sufi guy's shrine. I don't know if it was. I think it was earlier in his in his travels. But he visited some guy's shrine, and he makes a point to say in the story, like this guy was a great traveler. Or no, he visits some the town that this guy was from, who was a great traveler, and he makes a point to say this guy was a great traveler. But I've traveled more than him, and therefore uh, I've like. He doesn't say he's better than, but he kind of is saying he's better than him, which I thought was a funny like. But he, it, those, those are rare. But right. yeah, it was a funny self serve, and I just remembered that when you said. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, when when Bruce Lee's like, this guy's a good fighter. Mm-hmm. I'm better than him, but he's a good fighter. I mean, you take his exactly. word for it. I mean, you know, it's it, it was Bruce Lee. Yeah, I mean, he he beat that guy up. Yeah. You know, Ibn Battuta at this point had already traversed more of the world than ninety nine percent of the people had ever in that time. It's a it's a point zero 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 percent of people right had traversed as much space as this guy probably Marco Polo and or all at least the people he dragged with him yeah only contenders yeah exactly <laughs> to um, at this point um, so the uh, so yeah he's in um, he goes and visits Constantinople he talks a lot about Constantinople but if you know it took up like ten like five pages or something but like I'm not gonna give you all of it what I am gonna say is that he um, he uh, he gets there. The the guards are you know if, if at first are like not really keen on letting this Muslim group in. So there obviously is some a little bit of like animosity going on there. Right. But uh, the the sult uh, the sultan the emperor of Constantinople um, as we know him uh, he calls him Takfir. I believe it's uh, Nicomedes or Nicomedes the third. Perhaps I can't remember exactly. I'll look it up in a second. Um, he lets them stay, right? And uh, he sees the uh, he goes and visits the Hagia Sophia, which he calls the Hagia Sophia. It sounds a lot alike, um, but doesn't go in because you have to like kiss a cross to go in. So it's against his uh, his religion essentially. Um, he visits with the old king, which is this weird story where the guy before uh, Takfir took over was his dad, and his dad supposedly like um, gave up the throne to go be a monk. Um, the real story, uh, according to the, the book I read, was the origin. The king before Takfir uh, was uh, like kicked out, basically, and, and basically told to go be a monk. Um, right. And by the time Ibn Battuta gets to Constantinople, that guy is already dead. So he didn't meet the actual old emperor. Um, and so the guy he met was either not like was either pulling his leg. Or he was crazy, maybe, you know, right. like, um, or he just, you know, Ibn Battuta made up the story. I don't know. Or but, he um, met a ghost. Or he met a ghost. And, you know, he, considering so, what happens later on. Some mystical <laughs> stuff happens. You yeah. Know? Um, so he leaves eventually from Constantinople, and uh, but the Katoon, the Katoon stays. So she stays. And I guess... Well, she's given birth. Well, she's given birth, and then she decides to stay anyway. So she's like, I don't want to go back to my dude. And, uh, but uh-huh. I, apparently she does go back because, like, I, again, I read in the book there was no, like, you took my wife thing going on. So she goes back at some point. Um, but she decides to stay. And it's funny, too. One of the things he mentions 
that I forgot to write down was that as soon as she crosses into Christian territory, like she starts eating pork and drinking and um, like... Well, yeah, that's not her beliefs. Yeah, and she's like, all right, I'm not Muslim anymore. Peace. You know, like <laughs> I can do whatever I want again within Christian reason, I suppose, according to the time period, you know, but like um, that it's funny. Uh, and again, he doesn't say shit about it. So, I, you know, again, I think maybe... Um, He's in a place where he's like, oh, that shit's not going to fly. Um, his slave has a baby, which is his baby. Um, and uh, it's good luck because she's born under a good sign or a good star or something. The baby dies two months later, he adds. But uh, not, not it works out. so good. Yeah. No, not good for the baby or the slave. You know what I mean? But right. like Ibn Batuta's happy. So whatever. Uh, another one of those things. Uh, another one of those uh, man of his time quote-unquote things, I suppose. Um, he visits uh, the Sultan of Transoxiana, which is like Turkestan, Afghanistan area, and um, he visits Kabul. Uh, he There's a tribe living in Kabul called um, the Al-Afghans, and obviously those are the Afghanis, and uh, he is later, his, his caravan is attacked by Afghanis later, and they fire arrows at him, and they run away, and, that's, and then he's on his way to India. Yeah, and that's that's where my part ends, and we, yeah, yeah, yeah. we are already as far as we made it in the last podcast in terms of time. Awesome, <laughs> awesome, and we're only halfway there. We're halfway there. All right, here we go. Well, actually, in the way that I heard it was um, he was uh, it was you know, twenty two guys with him. Okay, and um, no, it was more than that. No, they have like fifty guys with him, and then twenty two people attacked. And they killed 12 of them. And okay. so the 10 guys ran away. Yeah, but they just shot arrows at him. Um, all right. So, yeah, he's uh, going out through Afghanistan. And uh, in, so he begins to try and make his way to India. Because um, at this point, you know, two or three different people have told him that you will end up in India. So he figures it's probably about time. He that goes. He goes, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and so he, and he mentions couple of different times how he does not like the journey because it's through the desert um i mean it's elevated so it's cooler but it's not there's not more plant life or more water um he goes at lengths to talk about you know we have to make sure this leg of the journey because we only have three days of water for this and so you know blah whatever all right anyway so he gets to (laughs) so he's so he's getting india and uh when he reaches the um he's heading into the realm of the muhammad shah He's the Sultan of Delhi and kind of, he's the main Sultan of India. I mean, India is a pretty big place, so there's some other Sultans in the south, but he's pretty much ruling over the all of northern India. And um, when you get into his territory, there are these little checkpoints all around it, surrounding around it. And um, they're either like men just sitting there or men with horses sitting there. And when you come up, you have to tell those guys who you are what your business is, if you have a title, and you know why you're coming in, and kind of declare. You know, they're they're basically you know um, border patrol. Mm-hmm. And um, so when you get there, uh, so he got there, and he tells them, you know, yada yada this and that. And uh, Ibn Tuta says that it's about 50 days away to Delhi, which is the capital where he's headed. And um, but the runners, this guy, so he gets all the information. The guy runs, and he runs for a mile, and then there's another checkpoint in a mile and mile and mile and mile, so on. So they actually get the information there in five days as mm-hmm. opposed to 50 days. So this this uh, Muhammad Shah knows who's coming. Um, and so basically what John and I were talking about is the Romans did the same kind of thing. Um, I think the Greeks did or whatever. But, some, but basically Benjamin Franklin did not uh, come up with the Pony Express, as, um, as America likes to say. Um, you know, old, old, old thing. So... Um, and uh, so he's he makes it into India and he starts talking about um, that uh, he stops in little villages, nothing really of note. Basically, what they have to eat there. There's dates um, that he likes. There's uh, you know rice. He makes mention that there's this black rice that's um, uh, like 90 days old. That it doesn't go bad or doesn't lose its flavor. You know, he, he loves he loves talking about food. But anyways, so um, he goes. He's getting close to Delhi. And he gets there to meet the Sultan, but the Sultan actually had gone out somewhere else. So by the time when when Muhammad's coming or when uh, Batuta's coming in, 
uh, Muhammad Shah is coming into Delhi at the same time. And so their little processions kind of meet up with each other. And so what happens is he writes in the book there about how when he's coming in, he notices that they've got all these elephants. But what's weird about this is that he notices that there are elephants that have catapults on the back of them. And uh, so when and he doesn't understand why they have elephants with catapults on them, and he quickly understands why, because the the Shah, he is the richest, well, second richest, because uh, we found out that uh, Mansa Musa is in fact the, the, was the richest, but they didn't really know that. So what they did was they, is, but they thought he was the richest sultan, but um, so what they would do is, with these catapults in the back of elephants, they would load money onto the catapults, and then launch them into the city and into the crowds as a way just like, hey, here's some free money, which sounds really cool until you think about like you're 50 yards down away and then like they're just launching gold at you and you get hit in the side of the head with gold. Like, oh, gold's heavy, dude. Yeah, dude. Like, <laughs> pow. I'm a little concussed, but I'm six pence richer now, you know? <laughs> um, six pence none the richer. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I just thought of. <laughs> if, uh, if we knew how to interject music into our podcasts, if we were better producers, uh, that would be playing right now. That would now, be happening right now. So be thinking about it in your head right now, though. You can, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to play along at home, that's what you'd do. Right. And so... Um, so Muhammad, no, the Muhammad Shah, the Sultan of there, is now in Delhi, and so is uh, Ibn Battuta. He's got like a day or two, and he has to go and meet the officially meet the Sultan and um, kind of tell him, you know, what he's up, what he's on about. And um, he finds out in this local custom that um, you have to get the Sultan a gift, which is weird because he's the richest guy in the area. But anyways, you have to get him a gift. But he finds out that the better the gift you give him. He always gives a gift in return. So the better gift you get him, he gives you something exponentially better. That's a good gift. It's not a bad idea. Yeah. You know, so he spends it. as much as he can on this gift. And uh, what he gives him is a bunch of horses, a bunch of camels, and a bunch of white slaves. And they say they make sure specifically that it's white slaves, um, which probably is rare or more rare at the time, you know, in India. Yeah. Like, they know who white people are, but, you know, like... Okay, well, here's some white slaves. Probably the probably the Greek, yeah, probably the Greek slave, and he at least had one. I, I well, there was multiple Greek slaves, but yeah, right. I mean, he at least had one. Um, and then so uh, so he gives it all to them, and he he was he was correct in in doing this because uh, the Sultan gave him two villages, like these are now your towns, yeah, and he gave him a job job as uh, Zakadi. Which is as we have seen so far has been. He went, he went to school for that. He went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he went, right, he went to school he for that. Yeah, okay. Degree. Well, then yeah. you get to do this, um, and a salary of twelve thousand dinar annually. Which, if we remember from the last podcast, um, one dinar was worth four point eight gold dust ounces. Four point eight gold ounces. Yeah. So twelve thousand of those every year. So that's pretty cushy job for just showing up at the place. It's a sweet gig, yeah. Not a bad. Yeah. You know? Um, and the, there's a place there that that, uh, that the that the Shah ruled out of. It was called the Hall of a Thousand Pillars. Uh, he spent eight years there attending the court of the Sultan. Um, the Sultan made him sign a contract that said that he's not ever allowed to leave his service except for um, religious um Holidays, mm -hmm. I guess. Not holidays like, oh, it, it's the month of Ramadan, like more like the British holiday, like you're leaving for a little bit to go yeah. on holiday. But, um, and then, like, if you're going to make Hajj, you're allowed to go. Yeah. But then it's you got to come back. Yeah. It's easy to agree those terms of service when you're getting two villages. But I imagine right. after a while, you're like, man. I, well, after eight years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, eh, it's like whenever I sign the new update for iTunes, you know, and then I find out that they're, uh, they get my first board. Right. All of a sudden, you know, I regret it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I had to have two kids now, at least. Yeah, yeah exactly. Really impacting my bottom line here. And then Verizon gets that one. But anyway. <laughs> um, but things are not all just um, money and grandeur because the this guy not was known for, for being the richest, but also for being what we would know nowadays is probably uh, bipolar. 
Yeah. Um, Ibn Battuta made made a point to note that um, whenever he walked into the Hall of a Thousand Pillars, um, there was usually a fresh corpse. Yeah. Like someone that had displeased him that day, or even maybe not. He was just like, and kill that guy, you know, and just move along. Um, so not. Not the greatest of fellows. No, man, that doesn't sound like fun. Yeah, we're, we're going to fast forward real <laughs> That's quick. real stressful <laughs> no. to be someone hanging out with that guy. You thought Henry VIII was bad? Yeah. You know, he's just killing people just because. He's like, that guy, get mm-hmm. him. I'm like, all right. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, fast forward real quick. That's interesting. Uh, the uh, One of the documentaries I saw is... Um, so the, how, the the Hall of a Thousand Pillars, it was this grand, grand thing, and it should have stood the test of time of mm-hmm. literally just being structured. But I was telling John before the uh, the podcast here that um, in in the in the documentary, it is a shell of what it used to be. I mean, the place is just destroyed, and it was destroyed intentionally so. Mm-hmm. And the story behind why on that one is, is one day there was this one really respected Sufi, you know, again, Ibn Battuta really likes the Sufis. Yeah. Um, there was one really respected guy in the in the surrounding area, and the the Sultan commanded that he come into his presence. Like, you got to come over here and tell me something about something. I don't know what it was. Doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, because the Sufis like, yeah, I'm not gonna go visit that guy. He's a tyrant. He tells that to the to the courtier, the guy who came to get him, and uh, so the courtier's like. You, don't want me to tell him that. And he's like, you go, you go tell him that. <laughs> you can and, tell him uh, that. <laughs> and so Cordia runs off, tells the Sultan, uh, he says that he won't come into the presence of a tyrant. And so the, the Sultan has him, he captures him, brings him to the court and literally feeds him shit. Not bad food, his feces. She yeah. feeds him feces until he dies. God, that is terrible. Right. <laughs> and then burns the body. Yeah. Which I figure... Not the worst part of it. Yeah, no, I think the poop part is worse. Yeah, far worse. And so now the the local populace, I mean, they probably destroyed it a long time ago. Well, they did destroy it a long time ago. They use it as an open air bathroom. Yeah, like there's like when they say like there's shit everywhere there. There, it's it's not a euphemism. Like, not great for sanitation, but I can see it. It's a great fuck you to the Sultan. A yeah. seven hundred year fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is awesome. Yeah, uh, because good on him. Oh, yeah, just screw that guy. Yeah, dude. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, but Ibn Battuta was this was the Sultan's favorite um, because again, as we were saying before, you know he's um, he's from old Muslim world. Mm-hmm. This guy, he was uh, he was a convert, and so he, you know it was really good to have this guy uh, Batuta around, you know, to help legitimately say yeah. what's up with what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then. Um, Ibn Battuta really liked the yogis that were going on, and uh, you know he was super interested about this. And um, we can actually which kinda... are not they're not Muslims, right? Yogis are no, Hindus. sir. They're yeah. Hindus specifically, yeah. And um, this kind of is my own yoga teacherness coming mm. out. Is mm. actually yogiism is a little bit different than Hinduism as well. Oh wow, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same kind of gods and stuff, but it, there's little, little little bits of difference. Okay. Um, I mean, it's not the same as, but like kind of the same ideas, like. Baptist Methodist okay you know like they have the same gods and stuff but you know like their belief in them a little different yeah okay yeah 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 um, but anyway so he he's still he's super into the, like these guys because you know as we've seen before he really likes all these Sufis and uh, you know so the mystics yeah. of, of Islam and so he starts hearing about these mystics of Hindu yeah and so of Hinduism so continuing he, his like his again his like his uh, white guy in India tour you oh know what absolutely I mean? <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> Like, like finding is, his place in Eastern religion. Right. right. This is that absolutely like seven years in Tibet right here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Eat, pray, love. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to San Francisco after this. Yeah. He's going to open up a yoga studio. Right? <laughs> and teach get, everybody. Get into aromatherapy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the story of him. <laughs> yoga. Yoga. Um, and so Sultan gets going to this and he takes him to go see some of this stuff. And um, some of the yogi mysticism, and um, he makes he has the them show them the stuff. And uh, one of the things is um, a yogi makes a guy levitate, um, and then another one is he makes uh, the yogi makes a rope go straight into the air, not attached to anything, you know, okay. and it goes way up into the sky. So it, it says that it's out of sight. And um, then the mystic says to one of his um, his helpers, like, climb the rope, climb mm-hmm. as high as you can. And so the guy does. 
and um, it says it climbs until he's out of sight as well. And then the yogi master calls to him three times, but he's so far up there that he can't be heard. And they wait a little while, and the guy climbs down. And Ibn Battuta says that he was so amazed by this that he fell to the ground. And uh, then the sultan looks at him and says, if you weren't so faint of heart, I would have them do things that would really boggle your mind. Mm-hmm. Which, that, I want to know what those yeah, are. Yeah, <laughs> like, too, dude. And then like in the documentary. Damn it, Ibn yeah. Battuta. The documentary, they just move on. I was like... No. <laughs> what, what are those? What are the other things? <laughs> you know, okay, because they had like uh, one of the descendants of the guys, mm-hmm. which either magic was really real back in the day, or everybody was super gullible, because they, they redid the floating guy trick, and it's they, they put a big blank, they put a big sheet over a guy, and he lays down, and then, then the guy floats up, and you can still see his feet underneath the blanket, you know, oh, and you can yeah. see him floating, which... He's got two pieces of wood, you know, and he's just standing up holding two pieces of wood where his feet would be. Yeah. You know, so, like, it looks like he's floating. Like, no, this, it's a bad illusion, you know. <laughs> or well, they, or, or just, magic was real, which is what I like to believe. Right, right. Magic was real back then. They even show the rope trick. It was like, it was like a, a, a stick went up that had, like, <laughs> rope wrapped around it. <laughs> right. It was like... You guys believe that? Like, that's not a thing. <laughs> they do, like, the finger trick. Like the- <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I saw a man remove his own finger, and he got my nose. <laughs> I never got it back. Never got my nose back. I think it's there, but it's not really there. Because he ate it. I saw him eat it. I saw him eat it. And, yeah. Um, he kept it pulling Dinar out of my ear. <laughs> but... Um, so uh, he sees all the, you know, he's, he's living in court, you know, getting and every now and again the, the sultan will freak out and accuse him of treason for whatever reason because he's bipolar. But he only, I often accuse my friends of treason, you know, whatever. You got to keep people in check. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's gonna make, like, whether or not they're actually being treasonous, you need to assert that they're not. You know what I mean? So give them a good scare. Make sure that they're not. Make yeah. sure that they are making sure that they're not. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Mind your P's and Q's, you know. <laughs> And, uh, okay, so he's hanging out, Imtut is, you know, ruling these two villages, making lots of money, but spending lots of money, spending too much money, and he gets seriously in debt. Yeah. And, um, even after all, he's making all this money and getting gifts from the Sultan, like, he gets in debt. <clears throat> and, uh, he wants to go, but he has to settle his debt. It's part of the law, you know, of uh, the Sharia law that he, you can't just leave debts out there. Um, and so what he does is he knows that there's the whole gift thing with the sultan. You know, you give him something, he gives something better in return. And he knows that the sultan has a sweet tooth. Mm-hmm. And as we mentioned before, he's got this Yemeni confectioner. Yeah. And um, so he gets his Yemeni confectioner to make all these crazy sweets that the sultan has never even seen before, let alone tasted. You know, and so he gives the sultan all this stuff and he eats a whole bunch of them and he's like, wow, this is the best thing ever, yay. And then when um, Ibn Battuta gets back to his house... There's three sacks of money just waiting for him. Yeah. I'd like to come home one day. Yeah. There's three sacks of money. Yeah, well, get your, get yourself a Yemeni confection. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to work on your uh, your entourage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jeremiah, Jesus. I've got people who like history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything for you. There's nothing. I'm not a confectioner. <laughs> so, um, so he gets all these sacks of money, pays up all of his debts, and then uh, he's heard about this one um, hermetic holy man that he really wants to go study with. And he's kind of tired of being in this crazy guy's court. Mm-hmm. Um, so he wants to go hang out with this guy. So um, he gives up all of his worldly possessions, um, except for probably the robe and the hat. Yeah, I would hope he'd keep those. Yeah. Because you know, he took them from a guy who who's, like got him from his father. Another crazy hermetic holy man. Yeah. You know, he's going to go live with this guy, crazy hermetic yeah. holy man. Might as well. Uh, but yeah, he goes and lives with him. Um, whose name is Kamala Dean, and um, I think that was one of the people that um, it was either this guy or the guy he's about to meet in here in a second um, that was like the brother. Yeah. Of, okay. Yeah, I think this is probably the brother that he's referencing. Okay. Because the you know the guy who said you'll meet one brother in India, India and a brother another in China. China. Yeah. When he might be my brother is you know another super like ascetic kind of holy man. Yeah. Brother kind of is in like uh, yeah spiritual brother. In, yeah. 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 And um, so what, where he, what he does with uh, Kamala, uh, yeah, Kamala Dean is uh, Kamala Dean literally lives in a hole in the ground. Okay. It looked um, – they, they, they found it in this one documentary. They found it and they, they, the guy goes and sits in it. And it looks like 
it was a tomb. Okay. And, and um, like the, an old guy who lived in the village who was feeding birds, they found he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah Kamala Dean used to live right there. Like, it's no big deal to him. But like, it was just this massive historical, you know, um, yeah. figure. And anyways, um, it looks like there's like a concrete slab and then just hole in the ground that you step into. <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, he, Ibn Battuta lives with him or hung, hangs out with him and um, he recites the Quran every day. I don't know how long it takes to recite the Quran, but... Probably a long time. Yeah, I mean, uh, a, a different one of my Muslim friends have given me a copy of the Quran, which I was very happy about. You know, I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, but I mean, it's a book. I mean, it's a big... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not short. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a book, you know. So I mean, like he's reciting the thing every yeah. day. So I mean, that's that's at least two hours, you know. I know that um, some like yogis and um, to this day, like they recite the Bhagavad Gita mm-hmm. every day. But I mean, and they they do it without break. They do it, you know, on the inhale and the exhale, and it's part of like a meditation thing. It takes them four hours to do it. Okay. I've read the Bhagavad Gita, not as long. Okay. As this. So, I mean, this is like at no less than a six hour adventure. Yeah. And he does it every day. Yeah. I wonder if he stops for snacks. I, I, I hope at least water. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he recites the Quran every day um, and he meditates a whole bunch too. Uh, the guy teaches him how to meditate. Or he may already know how, but he met, definitely meditates with him. He makes a statement of that. And um, it's important that he's in that cave because in Islamic thought, if you're in a cave, supposedly time stops. Okay. Because at that point, you're cut off from everything else, and it's just you and God. And so, and not in like a heretical sort of way, but, you know, definitely like it cuts out all other distraction. And so it's just you and God. So there is no time when it's just you and God. That's really cool. Actually, yeah. Actually, a really cool concept. Right. Right. Yeah. That's why I was like, that's why I was like, yeah. I often think of this room as my cave. I try Man it. cave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. It, I actually have this down. If there is one superpower I could have, it would be control time. Yeah. that That's a good... I, dude, I feel like that's a superpower that would be, you know, one of those things. It's like, you wouldn't... Yeah, you could do anything you wanted. At that point, done. Yeah. Win. Game Why over. Why you need flight, you know what I mean? If right. you could stop time, then you just like... like I'll get there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm just, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, anyways, sidebar. Uh, so he stays there for 40 days, does that, recites the Quran 40 times, apparently. Um, and then not there's any significance it's just that's the math Um, and the reason he comes out is the sultan finds out where he is and makes him an offer you can't refuse kind of in the the godfather sort of way because you can't refuse an offer from this guy Um, but also at the same time it's not a bad offer Um, he says the sultan tells him like I know that you really like to travel Mm -hmm. and uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, and he showers him with gifts. He gives him gold. He gives him robes. He gives him some horses. He, he gives him stuff, and um, which basically seems like that they've just been giving the same stuff back and forth for a while. Yeah, the two of them. What if he was just regifting all the stuff that he'd already? Right, right. Wanted? Wait, a second. I gave you this horse <laughs> really, two years just ago. Old horses. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, this horse seems oddly familiar. Yeah, the horse is like, I guess you go time to live in this stable now or whatever. No, we're going to our summer home. Oh, okay, great. Listen, didn't I give you, I, I just gave you this robe. What the hell, man? I don't like purple, do you? <laughs> hey, sorry. It's like the bread. Have you seen uh, old school? Movie old school? Yeah. yeah. The yeah, bread yeah, machine yeah. that he keeps trying to give. Right. The kid. <laughs> it's like that. It's like the bread machine. Um, so, he gives, so he gives all these gifts and an offer is that he's got to be an ambassador to China. Okay. And uh, the big reason he wants to go to China is because uh, Muhammad, um, the actual Muhammad, mm-hmm. you know, the, the you know, praise, not praise be, but um, peace be upon him, peace mm-hmm. be upon him, Muhammad. Um, he, in one of his sayings is that um, seek knowledge, travel, even if it should take you to the edge of the earth or even if it should take you to China, mm-hmm. you know, and I think. Maybe Muhammad was trying to be hyperbolic by saying, you know, even to China, you yeah, know. Yeah, probably like, in the same way we say, like, dig a hole to China, you know, like. Right, China right, right. He's just being very, very prolific yeah. about it. But, hey, yeah, these guys, you know, they went with gusto. So, um, so you know, he was truly taking it to heart, and that's where one of the things he was wanted to go and had been prophesied to be there, too. So um, so here's, 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 here's his way to go, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so he's going to be the ambassador because he's going to give a uh, gift to the Chinese emperor who had actually just given uh, Muhammad Shah uh, a gift. Um, so he's got to bring 
over to China, a hundred slave girls, a hundred slave boys, a um, whole bunch of different kinds of cloth, and then boxes and boxes of gold of silk, gold and silver. Which it seems like the again the royalty. I mean, the royalty is just exchanging like they're just going back and forth, just yeah. just shake hands. Like they, you could just shake hands, have dinner. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> dinner costs less. Yeah, exactly. It's all right. Give it to the people. Um, and they're gonna, all going to be carried, uh, you know, uh, accompanied by a thousand cavalrymen, which seems good. Yeah, that's Safe. a good amount of cavalrymen to have with you. Right, right. I, I leave the home with at least 500, you know what I mean, just because of things. Have you read the headlines? Yeah. There's a hurricane out there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, you know, what am I going to do without my cavalrymen? <laughs> Get robbed. <laughs> Get robbed. <laughs> Even though you have 500 cavalrymen, you might still get robbed because Ibn Battuta, as soon as they set out, gets robbed. Oh, wow. Gets robbed. A uh, bunch of tri- angry tribesmen mm-hmm. of, the, of the local area, I guess, who won't submit to Hindu or Islamic rule, you know, whatever, because India is a big place. I mean, it's a subcontinent in and yeah. of itself. Yeah. Um, so they ambush them. They kill 25 of the cavalrymen. And... Um, now I'm inferring this. We talked about this before. Um, yeah. I'm inferring this part. Twenty five isn't a huge number. Not a bit, especially out of a thousand. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they did capture him in Batuta. Now my reasoning for that is that he ran away. Yeah, and then later got captured, being away from the hot. He strayed from the big, pack. Oh, that's a bad choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they stripped him of his horse, his sword, um, and all of his clothes, mm-hmm. which I think means. The hat and the robe. Yeah, he got bummer, bummer. No, dude, that's kind of messed up. Right. I mean, I hope these guys at least know about. what they stole. <laughs> you know. But anyway, so we, um, after he, they do that. Um, he wakes up on the side of the road, and um, he he doesn't know where he is, and he knows that it's not good. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> it's he, not good. It's not this good. Is not good. <laughs> um, and he meets this guy named uh, Dilshad. And um, he, he was prophesied to meet, specifically by name, that uh, he was prophesied to meet this guy. And um, so Dilshad wakes him up on the side of the road and he says, you're going to get on my shoulders. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he does. What and, a guy. Right. Not only <laughs> like, awesome. am I just going to guide you? I'm yeah. going to carry you there yeah, like, on grad. my shoulder. What a great dude. Yeah. And um, he tells uh, he, he tells Batuta that, okay, so what, you, you just recite this over and over and over again. Um, recite, God is sufficient for us. And um, and an excellent protector, God is sufficient for us, and an excellent protector. And Batuta says that he recited it so many times that he felt his eyes become heavy, and he just fell asleep. And um, he woke up in a village, and then when he came out of the tent, out of the hut in the village, he was with his entourage again. Wow, that's cool. Right, and he never saw Dillshot ever. Again. Dillshot is the man. Right, <laughs> just saving the day, dude. He's. I mean, out of all, I feel like he's the the secret hero of this whole thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not Petuta. No. Not Petuta, no. <laughs> this whole thing was just a, a, a thing to get to Dillshot. And that's why I think also that he he ran away, mm-hmm. because he rejoined up with his company, 975 cavalrymen. Yeah, everybody's you know, fine. The, the, the gift is <laughs> fine. I mean, other than fine. 25 guys who died, which was sad. But like, right, but I mean, the gift is fine. All of the slave boys, all of the slave girls are fine, yeah. except for the fact they're slaves, um, you know. They're all fine. So, I mean, how did they get just him? I mean, they weren't singling him out. They didn't know who he was. He ran away. You guys are all all right? There was a horrible attack. <laughs> no, dude, you just ran away. You ran away. We killed them all real fast. It know? wasn't, yeah. We looked around for you afterwards. We didn't know where the hell you went, so dude. We sent Dillshot after you. <laughs> <laughs> so they uh, pick up on their trail. They go down to this place called uh, Kajarajo. And uh, the reason he writes about that is because of um, all of the sex that is had there. Mm-hmm. Um, there's literally a, a temple that has an orgy carved into it. Like, that's the point of the temple, is it's an orgy temple. Okay. Um, cool. The old orgy temple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what Come you're on into. now, the old orgy temple. We're having a great time, you know. Um, so that's cool. Um, but, he, but when he's there, he notices that there's a lot of other Muslim guys there that are specifically there to look for um, gurus, Hindu gurus, which is of note because they're not Muslim. Yeah. You know, Muslim people looking for teachers who are not Muslim. You know, kind of of note. Yeah. Interesting. That's, that's, yeah, it is Definitely interesting. The, the conglomeration of cultures. Yeah, there, yeah, know? yeah. 
Yeah. One All more right. instance where those religious, those religious, you know, supposedly those hard line religious uh, boundaries. Yeah. India, like, Pakistan, India, yeah, Pakistan. Yeah. Like, no, it was kind of one thing, yeah. and like they were just cool with each other for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, so they keep going south after that, and they make it to a place called Gujarat. And um, then there's a bunch of other cities in between here, but if we said every city that Ibn Battuta went to, so it would be three bad. hours of just city names. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And what they ate. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so they make it to Gujarat. And um, the reason he goes to Gujarat is because he's going to get these other 50 bodyguards to take with him on the boats and these Chinese junk ships, these giant ships, uh, to protect them from the pirates that are in these waters. Um, and the, they're very specific bodyguards because they're these um, people called the Hapshis. Okay. And they still live there to this day in India. And um, they've been there for, um, he talked to a lady there, and the lady said they've been there for about 700 years, this big group of them. And um, they're African people. Okay. So, and they have never intermingled with any of the Indian people around in India. Mm -hmm. So, and they were all Muslim. Okay. So here's this group of people in India who had been there for generations by that time who were all African Muslims in India. That's really awesome. Right. Just <laughs> insane. Which is really awesome from like, a, yeah, a cultural standpoint. Right, right, right. Cool. Like if you were like an, an ethno um, anthropologist, yeah. you'd be like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Come <laughs> on, Who are guys. you and what are you doing here? <laughs> You're really fucking up my, my thesis here. Right. We've been here for 700 years. All right, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so, but what's really cool of note about them is he shows up at the end of um, Ramadan, so the be the celebration of Eid, and um, they're throwing a party. And but what's of note about it is that it's this massive like tribal dance that's going on. In the documentary, the guy made sure that he got there at the exact same time that Ibn Battuta did because he wanted to see this because. It's they start playing these drums and these guys come out in um, definitely African tribal dress. Mm -hmm. You know, like the guys aren't wearing shirts, but they've got you know stuff around their arms with feathers coming off of them. They've got these massive headdresses. Most of the guys have face paint on, you know, and um, they're wearing these kind of loincloth things that have you know feathers all over them. So I mean, it's not Indian by mm -hmm. any stretch of the imagination. You know, this is. You know, in my head, it's definitely some more something more along the lines of like what I would think Molly's you know, what yeah. was doing at the time, or definitely you know just you know sub-Saharan Africa all over. You know, like that's it was definitely very African of what they were doing, but this entire celebration was about Eid, you know, and um, so they set these fires and these guys are blowing fire out of their mouths. They pick up these red hot coals and eat them, you know, and these songs and dances are going on. There's you know showings of like how good their spearmanship is. And um, and uh, the whole time, they're all everyone around is just singing. Um, there is no god but God, and but they're doing it in Swahili, you know. Again, Swahili in India, and they're Muslim. You know, it's just what yeah. is going on. And uh, specifically, it's because of all these things that they were the best bodyguards. Because it was said that if you had one of these guys on your boat, the pirates would leave you alone. Yeah, and he's going to hire fifty of them. Yeah, so good call. Good call. You know. So makes that safer. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> if you ever get a chance, look up Hapshis and their dances. It's stupid incredible to watch. Yeah? I mean, yeah. It, I, I was just Check blown away out. by it. Check it out. Um, yeah, so they leave there and they go to Calicut. Uh, Calicut is a main port down from... It's basically where all of the trade from China, India, and the Arabic nations all meet. You okay. know, like... Um, during the winter months, you would set sail from the Arabian Sea, then you would come to Calicut, then you would wait for the summer months. When the monsoon hits, then that those winds would hit you over to China, okay, and then back and forth, you know. So that was, you know, that was like your winter or your summer port, you know. And um, what was cool about that place is that they had actual free trade, one hundred percent free trade. Like John could show up in a boat, I could show up in a boat. There's no taxes. There's no tariffs. He and I trade back and forth for whatever we want, for whatever prices he and I set for each other, and leave. Mm -hmm. Unheard of. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, there, there's true. no docking fee. Like, like it's just absolute free trade. Libertarian wet dream. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that actually was the, the birthplace of capitalism? Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, Adam Smith, yeah, that's what he wrote about. Yeah. Was, uh... He took a trip to Calicut and was like, <laughs> this is it! <laughs> I found it! Um, anyways, so... Um, he shows up there in massive splendor, this and that, and um, 
but and this whole place was ruled by these one person called um, the Zamorans, and uh, one group of people called the Zamorans, and they had one rule for the area, and it was a pretty cool rule, and um, it was that you were not allowed to speak about religion openly. Yeah. And open areas could not speak about religion because uh, there were Jewish people there, there were Chinese people there, there were Arabs there, you know, there were Hindus there. There was everybody there from, you know, there's Buddhists, Muslims, Jewish people, Christians, uh, everybody was there. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't any fighting because nobody was allowed to talk about that. Yeah. You know, and uh, so pretty chill. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so... um, so he arrives there and, you know, massive pomp. There's trumpets blaring, you know, because he's, he's got a whole procession. You know, he's on an elephant that, he, that he's riding in there on, and uh, everything's super cool. And um, But he said it was to be punctuated by sadness. Um, so they're there for three months waiting for the right winds, and um, they're about to leave the next day. And the next day is going to be Saturday. And he stays aboard, or he stays on shore, because he's going to go pray the Friday prayers. And... This was the monsoon season, so it wasn't uncommon for there to be storms. Mm-hmm. Um, so he goes to Friday prayers, and um, but what happens is the storm was a little bit bigger than everybody thought it was going to be. Sinks the boat. Jesus. So 975 cavalrymen, 50 of the hapshies, 100 slave boys, 100 slave girls, all... You know, all His whole entourage of people. A whole entourage of people, the cloth, the gold, bottom of the ocean. Damn. Boom. And you can't go back... To the, to the sultan. The angry, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the sultan that, leaves a body outside of this yeah. <laughs> place every day. Makes this other dude eat shit. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do to me? You know? Yeah, like, exactly. No, thank you. Uh, so he decides, screw it. I'm leaving. And um, he hangs out for there a little while longer. But anyways, for in, in the sake of time and interest, he leaves. And he goes to the Maldives, uh, which are is an archipelago right off the southeast coast, uh, southwest coast. Southwest coast. Southwest coast of um, India. Okay. And a tiny little archipelago. Well, it's not tiny because there's thousands, 2,000 islands. But um, he goes and hangs out there. And uh, what he notices when he first gets there, um, he says this first. He says that um, the all of, because this place is Muslim too. He says that, you know, all the people there are very pious. They keep well with their daily prayers. That, you know, it's very peaceful there. That the food is wonderful. The climate is enjoyable. But the women don't wear clothing. <laughs> like he makes very much note that the only thing they wear is a sheet from the waist down and nothing else. Yeah. And he was very, you know, unhappy by this. <laughs> Which party pooper? <laughs> like in he, Batuta. He was having problems with the other people in like not wearing veils. Yeah, exactly. Like breasts just hanging out. Yeah. You know, like woo. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, but. He hangs out there for a while because he doesn't have anywhere else to go. He doesn't have any money at this point. And um, one of the things about the Maldives at the time, and uh, even for a long time, is that it was very easy to get married. Mm-hmm. And he said that was um, due to um, the the smallness of the dowry required and the beauty of the women. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he married four times. Mm-hmm. And um, you were actually able to get divorced very easily there, too. You could walk up to a lady, walk up to one of your wives and say... If you said three times out loud, I divorced you, you were divorced. Okay. Anyway, so he talks about the, one of the things in the Maldives, and he almost wants to just stop traveling and retire there because um, he notices exactly how well they have it there. Mm-hmm. Um, he says that, you know, the coconuts and the tuna make a man very fertile there, and so he said that he would meet each of his ten concubines every day and then go home to his wife, whichever wife's turn it was that night. This guy needs a fucking job, dude. What the hell? <laughs> like, <laughs> just eating coconuts, eating tuna, and having just sex with a lot banging of banging ladies yeah. all over the place. Well, he, he kind of did have it. He was he was the uh, he was the the copy again. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Cotty. 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 Uh, I wrote that wrong earlier, so it's just stuck with me. The key was the Cotty there. You know, again, he's got an in. Yeah. You know. So yeah, um, yeah. That that good old Islamic jurisprudence. You know. <laughs> man, traveling judge. That was mm-hmm. the job to have been. Uh, anyways, so um, so he was the Cotty there for a little while, and um, he got into lots of fights with the locals because they weren't following his strict clothing rituals, you know, because they were in paradise. Yeah. I mean, they, they live on islands, you know, yeah. like, put some clothes on, like, take your clothes off, you mm-hmm. know, was their response. Probably warm. Yeah, no Right, shit. Yeah, you know. Yeah, dude. When in Rome. Ibn, Ibn Battuta, party pooper, 
Huge hypocrite. Extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, dude. Anyway, yeah, I gotta go back to my ten concubines and my like wife. You know, but everybody I mean? better have a shirt on. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like okay. Um, so he decides that he's had enough of that and um, he wants to go back to traveling. So he leaves. But then again, then he gets a um, message from his brother-in-law um, because he had married into the royal family of the Maldives. One mm-hmm. of his wives was the royal family again. Privilege of being the Cadi, you know. Um, and so his brother-in-law calls him back because there's an uprising in the Maldives, which I don't understand. If, I mean, if the rules are eat coconuts, tuna, and hang out, what are you uprising against? Yeah. You know, what do you, I mean. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But anyways, there was. And so he came back, helped put that down. Um, and then was like, all right, seriously, I'm going to leave this time. And did. <laughs> um, and then, so he takes his ship, goes up to um, like what mo- is modern day Malaysia he stops off in Thailand, he stops off in Vietnam, and then goes up to China. Um, and very specifically, he notes those things because Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam uh, very specifically tell him how much they hate China. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it pre-sours him for China, but he definitely does not like China when he arrives. Yeah. Um, I think that's just too far out of his comfort zone at this point. Yeah. You know, because um, he's definitely left the Muslim world at this point. Even when... Um, I mean, for the bulk of his trip so far, he's been in Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. And even the ones that weren't, you know, they were at least had some Muslims in them or heavily influenced or at least he was familiar with, you know, like he knew who Christians were. Yeah. You know, the Crusades had ended, you know, just before he left. He knew where he knew what they were. You know, so, I mean, it wasn't this foreign thing. But, you know, he's showing up to China now. You know, he doesn't speak Chinese. He doesn't know anything about their religion. He doesn't know anything about their food. He doesn't know anything about their culture. All he knows is that there's some Muslims there. Yeah. And that he should go to China. So, I mean, it kind of sours him. It, he's, he's at the end of his ropes of, of you know, of, if he's a party pooper. I mean. Yeah, bro. He's really at the edge of this, like. This party's gone. You know, oh, there's on too far much too partying. Long. Yeah. I can't do it. I can't poop on all these parties. <laughs> <laughs> there's too many parties to poop on. Which, oddly enough, um, it doesn't even say, like, they're doing that many terrible things. He just doesn't. He's yeah. just completely over it. And this is when he really begins to start talking about how he's uh, becoming homesick. Um, but he shows up in Zaitun, which um, is still there today. Um, if I remember correctly, it's called Guangzhou now. Doesn't matter. I'm probably mispronouncing that, and it might be the next city that he goes to that's Guangzhou. But anyways, um, he gets there, and um, he meets up with these Muslim... There's small Muslim communities there. And... He kind of sticks to those places because, mm-hmm. again, he's not familiar with any of the food. He's lost his interest in really trying new and different things, um, at least as far as some of that stuff goes. And he really does not care for the culture, so he sticks with the Muslim communities there. Um, he hears about this other city that he really needs to go see um, called Canton. So he takes a boat ride, uh, a 27-day boat ride, um, up to Canton. And um, he doesn't like it there either. He calls everybody infidels, um, but he does hear about this 200-year-old monk or hermit, a holy man up there, and um, as is his thing, he must go meet this guy now. Um, so he goes up there, and because what he hears about him is that this guy doesn't eat, he doesn't drink, and like not drink liquor, I mean he doesn't drink water. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't eat, he doesn't drink liquids, and uh, he doesn't have sex, and his only thing in his life is about devotion, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, you, know, um, you can do that. I mean, I like all three of those other things, though, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah John's wife made some um, awesome, like, Asian-influenced chicken and rice this this evening, and yeah. it was fantastic. Fantastic. I ate too much. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> so I'm kind of on in to side on that one. You know, he loved food. I'm into that one. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, uh, so he goes and meets this guy, and um, he climbs up this mountain because, you know, it's China, so he's a hermit on a mountain. As, as they do. And uh, so, climbs up. He sees the hermit sitting out front of the cave. And he walks up to him. He bows, you know, prostrates himself to it. The right, you know, shows him his honor or whatever. And uh, the guy grabs his hand and he smells it. Which is kind of weird. But anyway, so he smells it and he says... <laughs> as, as you do. <laughs> like you do. You know. <laughs> hmm, you smell like garlic. I, I don't know. <laughs> so he grabs his hand, smells it, and he says, You are from one end of the world and I am from the other. Which, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, but... It's a pretty awesome thing to say to somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, just, <laughs> just by smelling them. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, here is a West African man 
in China on a mountain. Mm-hmm. Probably not real hard to see that, you know, like, <laughs> He's like oh, you are not different from around here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> what else do you got for me? Yeah. Um, so uh, anyways, so he, he talks to him a little bit and the guy looks at him and says that you are a miracle. You know, you have uh, fulfilled all the prophecies that have come to pass. You've skated death, you know, all the times that you should have. And, um, and tells much other weird things and he says uh do you remember the beginning of your journeys the man who gave you 10 coins and he goes yes i remember that man he says i am that man and he turns around and walks into his cave and him is like what yeah because that i think that's only a proper response and uh so he walks into the cave after him to presumably ask him what and uh and when he walks in guy's gone there's a servant there and uh, it's not like the guy, like, you know, put on a beard, you know, <laughs> like, it's not me. And, <laughs> different guy, <Yeah>. presumably. <laughs> and he looks at him and he's like, where is your master? And the guy says, um, this is what happens when he reveals one of his secrets. If you were to stay here for the next 10 years, you would not see the master again. But he is always with you. You know, again. Yeah. Kind of thing. Um, <laughs> right. So I guess it's, <laughs> so I guess it's like that's kind of like a the nice capstone on his his going farther away from home adventures. Um, you know, it kind of brings it full circle for his like okay, that I've reached the end. Here, yeah, you know, and uh, so he did he he did and he starts to come back. You know, passes back through his iTunes, takes the uh, the junk ship back, uh, Calcut, um, and then. Sh- Hops, skipping a jump to um, the uh, back to Arab, cuts through Yemen, Saudi Arabia. He goes back up through. He takes goes on Hosh again because I mean he's close enough. He's got a long way to go still. So yeah, you know, why not? He's liked it so much the last time, last four times he was right. there. <laughs> You're in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, you know it's only a couple hundred miles away. You have a couple more thousand to go. So what's a couple hundred? Uh, and uh, so then then he decides that he hasn't gone to um, Sardinia yet. You know, one of the islands off of Italy. So, uh, again, with the Genoese, he hitches a ride with them, stops in there, mentions the food, nothing really crazy. Uh, comes back to Morocco, goes to the capital of Fez. Um, yeah, he comes back so much faster mm-hmm. than he went out there. He was, he's not he's not like dawdling around. He's already seen all the sights. He's like, all right, I know about this, know about this, know yeah, about yeah. this. Like hey hey John oh, yeah, yeah no I'm just leaving yeah. hey Peace. all right <laughs> in, in town just for the night. in and out in and out yeah uh, so um, he gets back to Fez and he hears that uh, the king of Spain is at it again he's gonna try and kick more and more people out of um, out of southern southern Spain or what was it Granada. called Granada well they they Andalusia Andalusia yeah he was gonna finish the job you know um, and so he joins up with a bunch of people that are gonna help the resistance so he goes up there. And uh, on the way there, the uh, the king dies. So that plan died out, so that it ended up happening. But um, he didn't, ends up staying in Granada for a little while longer because it's another, you know, massive um, Islamic city that he hasn't seen yet. And, I mean, that one's right next door. Really could have yeah. started there, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that would have been a good place to start. <laughs> just, right, just right across the sea. Uh, so, he, so he goes and sees it, hangs out there for a bit. And then he hears about... Um, uh, he, he heard about Mansa Musa and all the gold in the Mali Empire and you know how crazy the Sub-Saharan African stuff is. So that's when when he goes down. Uh, Mansa Musa is not, excuse me, is not the king anymore or is not the Mansa because um, he passed away and uh, some like I think his heir um, mm-hmm. and uh, Suleiman maybe I don't know I can't remember. Yeah, something like that somewhere. And uh, so he goes down there, goes and sees Timbuktu, goes and sees Nyani. He goes into Gao. Um, as you may remember from last time. and um, But then in Gao, he gets uh, word from a messenger from the Sultan of Morocco that says, that orders him to come back. And uh, he, he obliges, he goes back, and um, the Sultan orders him to retell his accounts to um, Ibn Dwazi to, you know, because here's a guy who's, you know, seen the world, and, uh, you know, we, we got to get that story on paper before you die, mm-hmm. you know, because it's 29 years later. You know, he left when he was 22. Yeah, so I guess he's like in his 60s now. Right, right, right. 50, right? 50, 50, early 50s. Yeah, early but, 50s. But still, in 1300s, 
you know. Yeah, no, he's, he was an old man when he was like 30. You know what I right. mean? Right. <laughs> so he's point, way he's <laughs> old, you know. So we got to get this before you go. Yeah. And um, so he did, and he wrote it down, uh, or Dwazi did. And uh, and that's kind of it. And then he kind of just, I guess, retires into it. He becomes uh, a, a Cotty there again, but kind of just, I mean, they've already got plenty of them. So yeah. he just doesn't go into obscurity but just kind of retires and not as many parties to poop on there you know so he's like not well they're following the rules that he grew up with yeah, so he's cool saying. with them yeah, yeah, well, yeah that's yeah. what I'm saying he doesn't have anything to do there's no parties to poop on so he can't right. like, go yell at anybody or, right <laughs> <laughs> insult any sultans who are drinking too much or yeah. anything like that any Jewish physicians you know like he doesn't have right. anybody to yell at um, but what I found super interesting about this whole adventure is that um, he was the perfect man at the perfect time yeah. Because um, the way that it was set up, like we said earlier, with um, a lot of these places, um, the, the countries even themselves being Islamic had only been Islamic for maybe one, two generations. And then even over in China, you know, there's just this small community of Muslims there. So, you know, from the west coast of Africa to, you know, all the way to China, there was this unbroken kind of Muslim community. And kind of in, a, in not its infancy, but definitely in, in very young. Mm-hmm. And so he was able to travel that route because people wanted so much of that old world knowledge that he was able to get through that. And, you know, as time would go on, wars would happen and, you know, definitely more borders would be, you know, would be much more strictly enforced. Or he wouldn't be received as well because they already have their Qadis. And, or maybe it wouldn't be as easy for him to traverse everything yeah. because he wouldn't be showered with so many gifts and so many different opportunities. So, I mean, he was almost in a way that, in a time and a place that that could never happen again. Yeah. that's And one of the things, um, and I don't know if this is the same for the places you, I don't know if you guys could tell, but Jeremiah read one half and I read the other half, like kind of focused on two different halves. Um, but like, one of the things that um, the book, The Adventures of Ibn Battuta, that like kind of expounds on all the stuff and talks about the background to all the things he's doing. Um, one of the things that it points out is that throughout his whole travels, like in Persia, the guy he visits in Persia is is literally like within the next you know couple decades or something like that about to get kicked out. Like he's about to be right. Like, um, the other people like. Even being tra- able tra- to traverse between Morocco and um, and the, the the people who ruled in Morocco and the the Mamluks is um, was like something that he couldn't have done as easy um, a few years prior because there were a lot of wars. Like a lot of these people are either in the um, the beginnings of being kicked out of power or they have just stabilized power. Wise guy and like literally just you know. Like, he just got lucky. Like, a right. war just ended. Like, civil unrest just ended. All this stuff. So he's, like, again, like, right place, right time. The whole All thing. the way through. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, like... Because, really, I mean, for, for as far as he goes, um, and for as violent as we consider, like, the medieval world being, or I should say as I consider it being... Perceive it being, yeah. He's... I mean, yeah, there's, like, bandits on the road and stuff <laughs> like that. He takes... But there's not... For all the times where there's actual violence, it's not as much as you would, I guess, think they would right. be, maybe. Right, I would have expected. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Maybe that's because lack... Maybe there was more and he didn't talk about it, but, like, I don't know. I thought that part of it was pretty cool. Like, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, just the fact that, you know, even could make a trip as a person from Morocco to Arabia is pretty wild and like and have it be relatively safe. You know, granted he was in this caravan he was but like, you know, like that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Um so And again like he went to Granada yeah. very quickly was not a thing anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean Granada still exists, but it was not in the hands of, of yeah. you know Islam. Yeah. By any means. And even in India, the power of the 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 Muslim sultans waned very quickly. Mm-hmm. It went straight back in the hands of the Hindus because then, you know, later on when the uh, when the English show up, it's yeah. you know India, except for you know, like the north uh, west corner, which eventually becomes Pakistan. You know, I mean, there are Hindus that lived lived in Pakistan and Muslims that lived in uh, India, but the Muslims were not the ruling families in mm-hmm. you know where he went to visit them anymore. You know, so I mean, it was. For that window, it was probably maybe a 150-year window. Yeah. 
you know. And you, we could think that, you know, ooh, 150 years, you know, that's a long time. But not really. No. You know, I mean, 100 years later, the Byzantines was was not a thing anymore. Yep. You know, Ist- or Constantinople was Istanbul. Mm-hmm. You know, as they might be giants absolutely points, you know, accurately <laughs> points out. <laughs> yeah. And it all, and, and, and yeah, it's, uh, it's like this, yeah, he's really traveling through this world. Um, that's simultaneously like in flux, like it's yeah, the world's in flux, like sim- like new, like um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but one of the did I mention this in the podcast? Like one of the people he, he visits um, when he's in like the area of, of the steppe or whatever is gonna be the future. They're the future Ottomans, like they're the people right. who yeah, become yeah, yeah. the Ottoman Empire. Right. Um, before they're the Ottomans, you know what I mean? Like they're the, the descendants of Osman at the time, but they're not the shit you know like they're gonna and be when he was in Turkey he met he met up with a bunch of these guys uh, a lot of people probably heard about the the whirling dervishes mm-hmm. he meets up with the whirling dervishes and actually about another 110 years later those are outlawed yeah um, they're not allowed to be because um, because of Sharia law because the the whirling dervishes the way they wear those tall hats because those are representative of tombstones mm-hmm. they wear the white garbs with the with the like the skirt I guess mm-hmm. I mean but that's those re- represent um um, funeral attire, or like you know, funeral garb, and um, the whole idea behind them is that you are supposed to kill your ego so you can reach higher to God. And they spin around because they're supposed to get into this meditative state, and they hold their arms in this one way because you're supposed to be able to channel God directly, and that is not a thing that was okay later on in his yeah. life. Yeah, you know, and so they went underground because they had to. You know, so he went and saw them, and they were having these you know lavish. Um, you know, very public displays of this, you know, very soon after that, outlawed. Yeah, not allowed. And even they were Muslim, you yeah. know. It's crazy, man. And, you know, yeah, it shows the, I don't know, the way that, like, all this diversity existed within the regions which he traveled <clears throat> again, but also the way in which they were all connected in that there was this free flow of, you know, and I guess not always necessarily free flow, but like a flow of trade right. between all these places. Um, one of the one of the parts he's he's in Persia or he's in Arabia, but he talks about a slave boy dropping a Chinese dish, you know, and just like, and you know, it's like not, you know, we know that stuff from China made its way to Europe, you know what I mean? We know stuff from China, but like just like thinking about like thinking about the amount of time it took him to make his travels. I mean, granted, he was stopping in a lot of places, but the idea that goods and services. Goods make their way from China to, you know, Morocco. Right. Is insane. Like, right. For that time period. Because for us, uh, you know, like, they come on barges, you know, yeah. like these massive things that, you know, are thousands of tons, you know, but nope, one shipload at a time, mm-hmm. one small shipload at a time. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, globalization, uh, not a new thing. Not a new thing. It was, uh, it was going on then. Faster now. Um, yeah, <laughs> definitely faster. <laughs> very much faster. Um, and, yeah, like, I don't know. I guess the, the, I guess the coolest thing about it is, is like, like, this guy who, yeah, like, like, devoted his life to travel and he did it. You know, say what you will about his various uh, uh, issues, i.e., uh, party pooping um, and concubining and concubining, <laughs> yeah. Which you know, neither of which do I uh, do I subscribe to. But um, you know, he he traveled the world in a time where that was not the norm, and right. like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we like he learned a lot about it too, and I learned a lot by reading about him, which I guess was the point of this whole thing, right? Is for people to um, you know travel writing at that time was just about you know like people who yeah. Uh, who were rich enough to avoid books, but being able to learn about places that they weren't able to go on their right. own, perhaps, you know. And um, I, only, I only have two more things, but uh, one more thing is um, the one documentary that, one of the documentaries I saw, it was this British guy, and he basically just retraveled, mm-hmm. you know, um, all of the Batutas things. And um, he went pretty much everywhere. He wasn't able to go into Saudi Arabia. Um, very few people are allowed in, but um, <clears throat> he went pretty much everywhere else. And what he found was everyone there being so kind and hospitable. Mm-hmm. You know, he made very much point of that on one of the train rides he was taking that, you know, um, as, a, as a modern Western culture, what we look at is, you know, oftentimes with, you know, the thoughts of terrorism or, 
um, you know, this radical Islam, you know, he said that, you know, he, he spent half of his life inside, living inside of Muslim world, inside of the Muslim world, and he's never met anyone that was a radical Islamist, you know, and in China, they're having a resurgency of, of Islam, um, and, you know, and he's, he found, you know, an African group in India that was, that is Islam, and, you know, all of them just couldn't have been happier to have him there, you know, just super kind, you know, just telling, they're all, and he asks each of them, you're like, do you know of Ibn Battuta? And they're like, oh, I have Ibn Battuta, you know, and uh, another cool thing about that was that um, he had a few translators every now and again, but he almost didn't need it, because everywhere he went, everybody read, everybody spoke Arabic. Mm -hmm. because that's the way that the Quran is written and you're supposed to learn at least enough Arabic to be able to recite the Quran because it is the recitation. Yeah. And because it's supposed to be recite, re recited in, in Arabic. So everywhere he went pretty much, he was able to talk to everybody because of because he just spoke Arabic. Yeah. Which was super cool. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things, you know, like a, a unity of culture over vast distances, mm -hmm. you know, like allows that stuff to happen, which is, which is cool in the way that... Um, having a common cultural, like, I don't know, base can af allow people to share. And, you know, and the ways in which, like, I don't know, dude, I, I just, I, I get a kick out of, like, the whole, like, you know, like, him visiting the borderlands and seeing how those, those traditions that he held very dear were, like, kind of, like, blurred at those border areas. But, um, yeah, you know, they're still, I don't know. I, I'm, at this point, I'm just rambling. I'm tired. This is like well past my bedtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you hung out with us for this long, awesome. Yeah, well done. You know, really, I mean, I thought it was gonna be three hours. It's only been about two and a half. Two so. and a half. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It's manageable. You can break this into chunks and listen to it. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, I think we're gonna sign off uh, again. I'm John. I'm Jeremiah. And uh, this is History Schmistery and uh, second episode. And thanks for sticking all around. And I don't know what we're going to talk about next time, but it will be fun. It'll be fun and it will have already happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No current events. <laughs> Goodbye.